last weekend and let's see how far our participants have enjoyed it okay so let's start with the question number 1 which was which factor is not directly related to neonatal fracture shaft of femur and the options were excessive traction or torque during delivery uh, number 2 osteogenesis imperfecta number 3 non accidental trauma and number 4 multiparity multiparity came out to be uh, the most voted option and which is indeed a true answer number 2 which would be an unreasonable examination or investigation in a case of fracture shaft femur in a four year old with a history of other skeletal injuries so uh, number 1 was examine the sclera number 2 take a detailed history on the circumstances of injury number 3 metabolic screening and number 4 none of the above and the correct answer is none of the above which was indeed answered by 75 people that is 78% of the participants and that means all the other three options would be a reasonable would be a reasonable um, investigation or examination to perform number 3 the least common fracture in uh, pattern in children with soft femur fracture is long oblique short oblique number 3 segmental and number 4 spiral 91.7% of the participant answered it right that is segmental shaft fractures number 4 elastic stable intramedullary nail is least effective in tolerating number 1 was translation number 2 axial compression number 3 rotation and number 4 angulation here uh, rotation was uh, uh, chosen as a correct option by 36.5% of the cases of uh, 8.3% of the answers were in favor of angulation while the correct answer is axial compression and 52 Um, of the participants are answered it correctly number 5 what should not be done while doing an elastic nailing in this 7 year old old child with short oblique mid shaft femur fracture uh, so bend the nail four times the diameter of the femur bend the nail acutely at the ends just outside the entry point to make the removal easier number 3 use nails of the same diameter and number 4 use nails of the diameter 40% of the diameter of the isthmus so these are the options and um, the options which should not be performed is the bend is to bend the nail acutely at the end just outside the entry point to make the removal easier because that comes up with the uh, numerous complications and uh, which was correctly answered by about 60% of the participants so uh, it's good that we have been able to convey the message across number 6 which is not a problem in submuscular breech plating fracture femur in a 12 year old child number 1 prolong uh, protection from full weight bearing number 2 it cannot be used in comminuted fracture number 3 valgus deformity distal to the lower end of the plate and number 4 a second surgery for removal so the one which is not a problem is cannot be used in a comminuted a uh, fracture because it indeed it can be so if uh, about 60% of the participants answered it correctly number 7 all are acceptable configurations for a hip spica in a 2 year old child with a fracture shaft femur except number 1 single walking spica number 2 one and a half hip spica number 3 90 90 position and uh, number 4 30 30 30 degrees position so the correct answer is 90 90 position which is discouraged all over the world and this was correctly answered by 64.9% of the participants and then we presented an um, x-ray of um, elastic stable intermedullary nail and where the nails of two different diameters have been used and we wanted to know what the likely outcome would be for this construct so number one healing without any complications uh, number two non union number 3 varus at the fracture site and number 4 valgus at the fracture site so the correct answer would be there would be a chance of varus at the fracture site which was correctly answered by about 3/4 of the participants number 9 3 year old boy suffered a fall and the x ray is given at the top and uh, no other injuries the best treatment would be number 1 public harness number 2 thomas splint uh, number 3 hip spica and number 4 elastic nailing so 92.8% of the participants are of the opinion that hip spica would be the correct answer and indeed it is number 4 which rigid nail entry point is not permitted in a fracture shaft femur in a 12 year old boy so what is trochanteric trick entry number 2 piriform fossa entry number 3 lateral entry and number 4 is none so the correct answer is uh, piriform fossa entry which was correctly answered by about 88% of the participants uh, so that uh, finishes my 
a slot of uh, shaft femur fracture. Uh, thank you. Thanks there. a lot, to Dr. Sukalyan. May I now request to you to stop sharing and Dr. Sandeep Pai to start sharing his the second part, which was on neck femur and ankle fractures. What are you, Sandeep? Unmute yourself, Sandeep. Yeah. So then, can you? Uh... Yeah, can you play? Right. So the first question in the uh, ankle foot and uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is question number eleven, and uh, uh, it was pertaining to this X-ray, and the question that was asked. Just a minute. Yeah. What is this fracture called? And most of the delegates, that is seventy-nine percent delegates, have got the answer correct. This is the snowboarder's fracture. Question number 12, which of the following statements is false? And again, about 36% delegates have got it right. The statement that subchondral lucency of the Taylor dome, that is Hawkins sign after Taylor snicks fracture, indicates avascular necrosis is a false statement. Actually, Hawkins sign indicates that there is no avascular necrosis. So it's a good prognostic sign. Question number 13, uh, which of the following statements is false? So the first four statements are all correct. That is, displacement more than 20% uh, is a risk factor for failure of close reduction. Also, associated fibula fracture is a risk factor for redisplacement following close reduction cast. Open fracture is a risk factor for adverse radiographic outcome following AC nailing and plating results in better alignment in children in tibia fractures. So these were the conclusions of papers published by uh, Andrew Pennock in JPO in 2017 and 20. Which of the following is not a determinant of risk of avascular necrosis? The correct answer is option three. That is the Powell's type. 49% of our delegates have got it right. All the other factors are determinants of the risk of avascular necrosis. The next question was pertaining to this X-ray, which is an X-ray of a triplane fracture. And the question asked, was which of the following statements regarding this injury is false. And the correct answer is option number five, that is preservation of facial growth is of great importance. We know that triplane fracture occurs towards the end of skeletal growth. Therefore, there is not much of a growth remaining in the physis and therefore it doesn't matter whether the facial growth is preserved or not. Next question was pertaining to this X-ray. This is a Delbay type one fracture in a two year old child. And the question asked is, what would, how would you treat this injury? And the correct answer is close reduction, K-wire fixation, and hip spica cast, with 64% of our delegates have got bang on. Next question was related to this X-ray. This is a supination inversion injury, fracture medial malleus of the distal tibia. And the question asked was, how would you fix it? Again, we discussed this case uh, extensively in last week's uh, uh, conference. And 71% of our delegates have got it correct. It should be fixed with intra-epiphyseal screw, 4 mm screw fixation. Next question asked was, which of the following approaches should never be used for open reduction of femur neck fractures in children? And the correct answer is the Moore's approach, because we know that the Moore's approach can damage the vascularity to the femoral head. The next set, uh, question was, which of the following statements regarding non-union of fracture femur neck in children is true? And the option, uh, the correct answer here is option number five, that is fibula graft with valgus osteotomy is recommended in cases with established non with resorption of the femur neck in children. Last question, question number 20, which of the following statements regarding distal tibia facial injuries is true? Now here, I think a few of our delegates have got it a bit uh, wrong. Uh, that is, uh, most of our delegates have answered that telo fracture is an avulsion fracture of the tibiofibular introscious ligament. That is not so. Telo fracture is a dis, uh, is a frac uh, avulsion fracture of the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. The correct answer is open reduction of telo fractures should be avoided due to risk of damaging the physis. In fact, open reduction should be performed if close reduction is not successful because uh, articular congruity is of great importance in telo fractures. And the final uh, answer over here, I don't know whether, you know, Jayant has logged in, but I would like to inform Jayant that five delegates have a uh, thing that he is a race car driver and four delegates think that he is a gymnast. So I would like to congratulate uh, Jayant on that.
and uh, that's all from my end sopil uh, i hand it over back to you thank yeah you. thank you very much that is all we have time for and uh, we now move on to the main session and over to dr taral dr premal and dr sandeep thank you you can stop sharing sandeep yeah yeah so welcome everybody to the seventh session of uh, ifix 2020 and uh, we say that it's it's uh, 629 in bombay here and we say that uh, we are going to start at 630 indian standard time but we call it now at ifix standard time we are always ahead of our time we always start before time and we welcome everybody to this seventh session and i want to invite uh, sheetal to introduce the foreign faculty sheetal who is the moderator for this session and to introduce him he is the professor of uh, pediatric orthopedics and uh, sports medicine lover he is he has interested in arthroscopy patellofemoral instability shoulder instability intercruciate ligament and osteochondral injuries uh, he has written two important textbooks and i i don't know you know between his surgery seeing patients and writing textbooks how does he find time to do indian cooking i am sure his wife is a really lucky one and he travels and hikes with his children so that's introduction to sheetal he's been pillar for ifix from 2014 onwards to make this a truly international meeting going across the continents so sheetal i hand over the reins to you to to introduce the other international faculties sure thanks uh, tarul for that uh, kind introduction good morning everyone welcome to the seventh session of ifix this is the last weekend i hope that uh, we all had a uh, uh, great learning session i've learned a lot uh, listening to all the faculty uh, the, the cases have been fantastic so i really appreciate uh, uh, everything that uh, that the uh, indian faculty um, and organizers have done i'd like to introduce our speakers uh, for uh, the international speakers for this session uh dr uh, min coker he's from boston he's the chief of uh, sports medicine division at boston children's hospital and professor of orthopedic surgery at harvard medical school he's an incoming president for the pasna society and uh, he has a lot of important contributions i'm pretty sure everyone has heard of him uh he has written a lot uh, has presented at uh, at all meetings and has and has been a great uh, uh, teacher and a uh, colleague um Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Ted Ganley. He is from um, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where he is the director of uh, Center for Sports Medicine and Performance. And his clinical interest includes uh, pediatric sports, that is ACL reconstruction, OCD, cartilage preservation, and then pediatric fractures and trauma as well. And he has great contribution in the literature. Um, Uh, he's a co-founder of the Rock Group, which is the research in um, osteochondritis dissecans. He's a co-founder um, and uh, past president of the Prism, uh, which is a society for pediatric research in sports medicine, and he is a member of the multi-center ACL research group as well as the pediatric ACL research group. So um, I welcome both Min and Ted to these sessions. and it's my privilege to you know introduce our indian counterparts uh, the, to start with hitesh shah is a professor at manipal uh, kmc he is also treasurer for posi so he is very good with numbers and you can see he is good with publishing papers and managing money for posi and both requires deep knowledge of statistics traveling fellow fellow of core posna and apoa and he has a huge number of articles he likes to publish about uh, his his master of perthes and skeletal dysplasia and then we have tushar agarwal who is full time pediatric orthopedic surgeon with his private practice at astha hospital but he is also part time motivational speaker a spiritual person and a life coach so that's he has monday every monday webinar on ortho tv on various things which concern us better besides pediatric orthopedics jaydeep damele is a young pediatric orthopedic surgeon from bombay attached to jupiter hospital as rcc children hospital and i pod and he loves traveling swimming terrace gardening and what is not mentioned is dancing his dance is to watch for at all posi meetings vivek shivastava is from is a foodie he is from indore and i want to say that besides being a very good pediatric orthopedic surgeon he has excellent organizational skills we we have seen in the national conference last year Chintan Doshi is well traveled well trained and now settled in Bombay 
and is interested in pediatric orthopedics and sports medicine and rohan parwani is from a small town of gujarat called rajkot excellent surgical skills and excellent presence of mind and willingness to learn and these young guys are future for oc and i fix i want to say so with this uh, we start with sessions of uh, seventh session of uh, i fix which is on fractures around the knee we have divided the sessions into two parts talks where we are going to learn and cases where where this what we have learned is going to be applied and we are going to learn what what we know about the topic and we don't know. so i hand over to sheetal to moderate this session yeah so the first talk is by ted on uh, fractures uh, including distal femur and proximal tibia fractures so uh, uh, Ted, if you can unmute yourself, we can see you well. If you can share your screen on the bottom panel, there will be a share screen a button, and then you can start your presentation. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Yes, we can hear you. Great, perfect. Um, so we'll be addressing pediatric knee um, physial fractures and just some fractures uh, about the knee. What I was going to do is address uh, in our br very brief period of time uh, some of the um, aspects of how I approach these fractures uh, rather than being uh, inundated perhaps with the uh, data uh, today. I have some uh, disclosures. There are none relative to these, uh, th to these talks. These are all volunteer positions uh, that I have listed here. I have some detailed uh, disclosures in the uh, AOS.org. Uh, uh, no funds go directly to me. I'm on some study groups. Um, we'll be addressing pediatric knee physial fractures. Um, and our objectives and goals will be to address primarily distal femur, uh, physis, tibial tubercle, uh, plateau, and we'll address some eminence uh, fractures as well. Um, and we'll look to address some of the following features you see on the left. We'll start with distal femoral physial fractures. Um, they tend to occur in adolescents primarily, ages for the most part 12 to 16. Uh, that's the most common knee physial injury. Uh, mechanisms are primarily planted foot, uh, pedestrian versus motor vehicle accident uh, and breach. And we would uh, describe some of our classic mechanism with our American football, uh, these football helmets to the knee. Um, certainly um, soccer for both girls and boys as well. Uh, for Salter 1s and 2s, uh, patients are typically uh, unable to bear weight. You can see a small fleck of bone at the distal femur. 3s um, and 4s and have swelling and effusion. CT scan can help quantify articular displacement. And 1s uh, and 2s, if they're uh, reducible within 2 uh, millimeters of physial displacement, I'll use a, a long leg uh, bivalved cast. Be aware of the medial fracture, Salter three fracture, plus the terrible triad. So ACL, MCL, and medial meniscus injury. Um, in those scenarios, I've seen and been referred patients that have had some arthrofibrosis when all of those things have been addressed simultaneously. So in the first stage, I like to uh, fix the fracture. If there's a bucket handle meniscus tear, I'll address that. But if uh, otherwise, I'll address in the second stage, the ACL with the meniscus. Hopefully the uh, medial collateral ligament can be treated conservatively, it's grade one or two, but if it is, uh, needs to be addressed, that can be addressed at the second stage as well. Um, in uh, val the, you tend to get uh, periosteal disruption from varus and valgus uh, load. If there's hyperextension, uh, the displacement tends to be anterior. If it's flexion uh, type injury, it's posteriorly uh, displacement of the fractures. Uh, MRI and CT can help uh, address not just displacement, but evaluate for growth arrest. And you can see an example in the upper right. If you have these physial fractures in infants, you wanna just make sure the ossicle is in line with the femoral axis. Um, care for norovascular exam is uh, critical uh, for these patients. Um, so we'll evaluate the uh, vascular exam. So, uh, and then uh, arteriogram if the, ab if the um, vascular exam is abnormal. Uh, if there's simultaneous femur and tibia fractures or open fractures, but a high degree of concern for any of these fractures is appropriate. Um, so clinical scenario, number one, non-displaced fractures, treatment, long leg cast, four to six weeks, uh, displaced or unstable fractures, um, reduction uh, and smooth K-wire fixation. Here's an example 
of uh, one placed uh, from distal to proximal, it was intraarticular. Um, and we've had two uh, cases at our institution where there was a septic joint following this. So I'll place pins from proximal to distal uh, for those fractures. Avoiding pitfalls, reduction under anesthesia, keep pins out of the joint, um, and traction more than translation for these patients. For Salter II fractures, um, uh, if the Thurston Holland fragment is uh, big enough, I like to have screws that are placed in the Thurston Holland fragment. I prefer multiple screws, um, and it depends on the size of the knee, the size of your uh, compression screws. Um, uh, either four or five, or very large patient, large uh, Thurston Holland fragments, you can use larger screws, six, five screws. Um, I will use partially uh, threaded screws for those. Um, and so Salter twos, again, screws in the, in the larger Thurston Holland fragments, hyperextension, beware of popliteal artery uh, injuries, uh, check knee stability after healing uh, because of that, uh, again, uh, triad of potential injuries, especially that valgus stress. Um, I like to follow these patients for one year post-op uh, in epiphysiodesis if they're near uh, maturity and with uh, severe injuries, uh, bar excision if they're younger patients and less than 25% of the bar. And I'll use the um, arthroscope um, uh, when I excise these uh, bars just to, to actually visualize the physis. You can see a blue arrow uh, on the uh, physis in the lower right-hand corner and the surrounding uh, cancellous bone. Case example, uh, helmet to the lateral knee, 16-year-old male. And you'll note, uh, based on the patient's age uh, and uh, degree of growth remaining, uh, for the most part, closed on the uh, proximal tibia, still open on the femur, but went um, across the physis uh, just to get perpendicular to the uh, fracture site. Um, moving on to tibial tubercle fractures, you can see a large, uh, uh, piece of periosteum with that displaced fracture. You can see the uh, patella is elevated on that case. Mechanism of injury, jumping or landing, sudden quad contracture. One to 3% of all physial injuries, uh, males more than females, uh, tight hamstrings. Um, and the fracture classification can be through the ossification center or type two ossification center and epiphysis or three uh, through the epiphysis and intraarticular fractures. Um, clinical features, inability to extend the knee, hemarthrosis, uh, patella alta, as you can see here. Uh, those minimally displaced uh, or non-displaced, long leg cast and extension. Uh, for displaced fractures, um, screws in older children, K-wires in younger children. And I would, and sometimes I'll use uh, arthroscopic assisted reduction uh, as shown here. Um, and then um, but I, I wouldn't say that's uh, mandated, and I don't do that in, in all cases. Uh, it depends on uh, uh, fracture uh, pattern, uh, degree of uh, skeletal maturity, their uh, age, activity level. If I feel there's something comminuted, if they've had advanced imaging and they have a, a chondral fragment and they have a meniscus tear as well, then I'll address that. But otherwise, I have no problems fixing these uh, with simply open reduction internal fixation. I would point your attention to the upper left-hand image where there's a large periosteal flap um, I will baseball stitch that uh, periosteum and secure that down um, with high strength sutures um, uh, using um, uh, locking uh, uh, baseball stitch sutures, crack house type sutures, and then uh, place the sutures through bone. They can be used with a, uh, an anchor or just simply place in a uh, drilling uh, site through the bone to secure periosteum as well for further reinforcement of those. Uh, pitfalls, uh, compartment syndrome, beware the anterior recurrent uh, artery injury, and Raker, uh, Gina Rekervatum uh, higher in younger patients. I did uh, some work in Nepal in 2001. This is a patient who'd uh, been treated uh, with uh, fixation and the developed later uh, Gina Rekervatum. Uh, Again, uh, surgical keys. I like to uh, repair tears of the renaculum and uh, early range of motion in these patients uh, at uh, three to four weeks. Uh, proximal tibia fractures, uh, a, a very small percentage, 0.8% uh, of all physial injuries, most commonly adolescent boys, uh, same principles and rules as the distal femur. Um, Salter fractures can be markedly unstable. Even those that appear to be uh, Salter 1 fractures can be uh, uh, unstable. 
uh, injuries, uh, be aware of the issue again of uh, potential issues of injury to the popliteal artery, uh, collateral ligaments in the physis, and the, and the issues of compartment syndrome. This is the one area where if I feel that the leg is tense, uh, I will do uh, what I wouldn't say sp uh, specifically prophylactic fasciotomies, but if you have a sense that uh, compartment pressures are high, I have no problems releasing those intraoperatively during the case. Um, and again, physeal injuries, seeing an example of a plain radiograph and an MRI there as well. Um, and I would just say for patellar sleeve fractures, most commonly reported patella fracture in children, uh, they can have an effusion, small fragment of bone, patella alta sometimes. For displaced fractures, I like uh, sutures with uh, drill hole, longitudinal drill holes, repair the retinaculum, and early range of motion. For larger patients, I'll do figure of eight, uh, tension band wiring. Uh, I'll also do high strength sutures in very young patients as well, longitudinal drill holes and sutures uh, for those figure of eight fashion, but um, sutures only in very young children. So you can osteochondral fractures associated with the patellar dislocation. Uh, men will cover this, I'm, I'm sure, but uh, for, you can come from the patella or the femur uh, and can from the lateral femoral condyle. If fragments are two centimeters or larger, I'll, I'll secure those. Uh, uh, you can see the demographics of those patients uh, that get injured, uh, twist on a planted foot, the sports involved, mechanical symptoms, catching and locking point tenderness, pain and effusion, inability to bear weight. We're aware they get a hemarthrosis and apprehension test. Um, and I palpate for retinacular defect. We're aware of the classic physical exam findings for these patients. We're aware of generalized ligamentous laxity, tend to have less of these fractures. Uh, radiographs, AP lateral uh, mer uh, merchant, uh, MRI concern for fractures. Um, and then uh, we're aware of the uh, importance of uh, patellofemoral uh, ligament. Uh, again, my criteria for favoring fixation, if there's a fragment uh, defect match, there's bone on the fragment, it's, it's over uh, two centimeters. Uh, in terms of uh, tibial uh, eminence, I can sometimes get to the level of the physis. It's rare, three in 100,000. Acute injuries, direct blows, hyperextension rotation. You're aware of the classification system. Uh, if it's non-displaced or reducible, long leg cast and uh, extension or slight flexion. Uh, those that are displaced and comminuted, um, there's many methods available. I think that's appropriate for the uh, discussion section. I have no problems with sutures uh, or screws or arthroscopic uh, shoulder anchors. I think they're all reasonable fixation options. Keys remove interposed tissue or mid patellar portal. Um, here's one example uh, that intermenis the meniscal, uh, intermeniscal ligament getting interposed in the second image from the upper left. So a probe sweeping that out of the way. I get the debris out uh, before using mid patellar portals to secure whether it's with uh, screws or sutures. Pitfalls, loss of extension, residual instability, and stiffness and arthrofibrosis. Beware of these quote unquote fractures, which are the great imitators. The ossicle following uh, Oshkut Slaughters in the upper left, Cindy Gillars and Johansson upper right, uh, bipart pipe, bipartite patella in the two on the lower left, and lower right is Oshkut Slaughters itself. And we're all uh, well aware of these the bone subcondyl contusions associated with ACL and patellar dislocation, and those. OCD lesions that are diagnosed and sent to you as fractures. I've had those diagnosed as tumors before, but these are other uh, things to be aware of. Uh, be aware that each fracture, we try to be mindful of uh, mechanism, body habitus, alignment, rotational profile, degree of laxity, additional pathology, and past injuries. And each one of these is its own uh, unique, can have its own unique pattern. Um, hopefully we've addressed our uh, goals and objectives. Happy to have any uh, discussion and answer any questions and thank you for your time. That's a great uh, overview, Ted, uh, thanks. Um, while we switch to, um, uh, you can stop sharing your screen and Min can start to share his screen. Uh, one question, like for intra-articular fractures uh, of the distal femur and the proximal tibia, which are Salter Harris three and four, do you get a CT scan pre-op for your planning, surgical planning? Um, they tend to, um get those. I would say I do like to get those. I feel like um, I'd like to see if there's any comminution of the fracture. I like to see where it's displaced at the uh, uh, articular surface. Sometimes it can be more displaced than it looks on the plane radiographs, so they can be a little deceptive. That's why I, that's why I do like um, CT. And then you mentioned the point about, you know, stability of these injuries because they may have concomitant ligament injuries. So how do you screen for those ligamentous injuries? Like, do you just fix the fracture and then check in follow-up and let the family know that there might be something that you may have to address later? Or do you get an MRI uh, with these injuries to, to diagnose ligament injuries? 
Yeah, so I find that um, some of these valgus injury uh, pattern uh, fractures um, can be even found uh, uh, on MRI after someone gets the, the primary diagnosis is an ACL injury and on MRI uh, imaging, they'll get uh, find a fracture. So I've been a little higher uh, likelihood of getting an MRI if the salter fracture of the distal femur is medial uh, rather than lateral. Um, but mm -hmm. I would say that if, uh, if I have suspicion based on their, uh, uh, based on their history, based on their findings, I, I, I have no problems getting an MRI in lieu of a CT. I think you can see those, uh, that displacement as well. I mean, do you have any thoughts on CT versus MRI or both for uh, intra-articular fissure fractures, SALTA 3 and 4? Sorry, on just there? unmuting <laughs> there. Okay. Um, no, I think you could do either. Um, I think MRI will give you better uh, information about the soft tissues such as meniscus or ACL. Um, I think the lateral um, uh, Salter injuries, you also have to be aware of the ACL femoral origin. Um, so I think either is okay. I think if you're worried more about bony detail, I think CT is good. I, I would say that at many of our institutions, I'm sure yours as well, Chital, there's a real sensitivity to radiation in children and, and CT scanning and, and a compelling reason um, to do uh, a scan. Great, all right. We can uh, start with your talk, Min. Um, okay, great. Let me try to go full screen here. Okay, can you hear and see this, Chital? Yes, we can. Well, great. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be, uh, quote, here at the uh, IFIX meeting. Um, you know, I think with the COVID pandemic, I, the downside is not being able to be in India in person, but um, the upside is to be able to put together such a great conference with people across uh, the world. I really wanted to congratulate the IFIX team um, for putting together uh, a wonderful series of lectures with pre-test, post-test, uh, and articles. It's really uh, a great example of what um, we can learn and what we can do um, uh, during this pandemic in terms of education. Um, it's a treat to be a, a panelist with uh, Ted Ganley, one of my uh, closest friends. Ted and I have done a lot of lectures across uh, different places. This was from Switzerland. Uh, I like to say he's my brother from another mother. And in this case, Ted, you're, you've got an Indian mother because you're in an Indian conference. Um, greetings from uh, Boston, from Children's Hospital Boston and uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, and also uh, greetings from Pozna. Um, uh, like uh, everyone, we've struggled with the uh, COVID epidemic in terms of our uh, meetings and our meeting, annual meeting last May or this May was canceled. Uh, and went to an online format. Uh, and we're hoping to have our um, uh, meeting in 2021 in Dallas, Texas in person um, with a hybrid component. Uh, a reminder that abstracts for this meeting are due uh, October uh, 3rd. I think Dr. Nagda said uh, he will send out reminders to the um, POSI uh, members. Um, one real joy for me has been to um, uh, reconnect to India through uh, pediatric orthopedics uh, and attending uh, multiple POSICON meetings. Uh, I think the relationship between POSI and, and POSNA is very important. Um, and I thank Shital and Sanjeev Subarwal for being um, such great liaisons and thank you all for your hospitality. Um, my parents both came from India, my mom from New Delhi and my um, father from um, Punjab. So I uh, spent uh, many summers traveling back to India when I was a child and it's uh, great to be back um, now as an adult. Um, so my uh, task was to talk about intraarticular fractures of the knee and I thought I'd focus on the um, tibial spine fracture um, instead of sort of a more, uh, um, a shorter uh, overview. Um, to go more in depth in, in terms of this fracture, as it's the main intraarticular fracture we see in the knee. Uh, my disclosures are shown here. Uh, I think there's no uh, conflicts um, with this presentation. Um, the tibial spine fracture has been called um, the pediatric ACL injury. 
Um, this is an avulsion of the intercondylar eminence uh, from the ACL. Um, we see this in childhood play, and we also see this uh, in youth sports. Um, why we get an ACL mid-substance tear versus why we get a tibial spine fracture is not quite clear. It may be related to the relative strength of the um, ligament versus the bone. Uh, may also be related to the loading conditions, so faster loading conditions resulting in ACL and slower loading conditions resulting in tibial spine. Um, it also may be related to anatomy. This was a um, case control study we did comparing 25 age and sex matched mid-substance ACL tears to tibial spine fractures. Um, we found that those patients with tibial spine fractures tended to have a more narrow notch in the distal femur. And we know that this notch um, it, it changes with um, maturity and with adolescence. Um, tibial spine fractures, the signs and symptoms are fairly straightforward. We'll have a hemarthrosis because this is an intraarticular fracture. Um, there may be a lack of extension because of the bony block uh, and anterior laxity of the knee because the ACL is no longer in continuity. Uh, typically, we're imaging this with a lateral knee x-ray. Um, the Myers and McKeever classification is shown here where type one is non-displaced, type two is displaced but hinged posteriorly and type three is completely displaced. Um, type four has been added, which is displaced and comminuted. Um, one question I think now is, should you get an MRI of the knee? Um, reasons to not get an, uh, an MRI is the thought that associated injuries are uncommon and we'll see um, these injuries arthroscopically anyway in the cost of MRI. Uh, one uh, reasons to get an MRI is you may miss associated injuries. They may be more common than we think. Uh, and particularly if you're gonna do non-operative treatment, it's important to know what those are. Um, this is a study that's hot off the presses. So it was just uh, published uh, two days ago. Um, uh, Ted Ganley is one of the uh, co-authors and Ben Yen from our institution. Uh, and this showed a relatively high, almost uh, 40 to 50% rate of associated meniscal injuries or entrapment of the intermeniscal ligament um, uh, in patients who got an MRI with tibial spine fracture. So I think this is a reasonable option now, uh, particularly if you're gonna treat um, non-operatively. What are the options for treating a tibial spine fracture? They're shown here, um, non-operative treatment, um, which is a closed reduction, uh, in extension or, or slight flexion with casting or bracing, um, operative treatment, which includes open reduction, also arthroscopic reduction, internal fixation. For internal fixation, we have sutures, screws, and bioabsorbables such as anchors. Um, why would we want to treat a displaced tibial spine fracture operatively? Well, it's to get anatomic reduction to avoid the issues of lack of extension, um, from the bony block and instability from incontinuity of the ACL. Also, this may allow for early mobilization, which has some benefit in terms of scar tissue arthrofibrosis, um, and to treat the associated injuries, chondral and meniscal, including entrapment of the meniscus. Entrapment of the meniscus had been reported in various case reports. Uh, in one series of 10 patients, it was found to be common. In another series of 12 patients, it was found to be uncommon. Uh, we published this retrospective case series of 80 patients, type two and type three tibial spine fractures treated operatively, and we found it was relatively common. So a quarter of the type two fractures, these are the hinged displaced fractures, um, had entrapment, and two thirds of the type three, the completely displaced fractures, had entrapment. And what was entrapped was most commonly the anterior horn of the medial meniscus or the intermeniscal ligament. So the lesson here is to um, uh, have a high index of suspicion for entrapment of the meniscus. The prognosis for tibial spine fractures um, uh, tends to be good. Um, so even with anatomic reduction, internal fixation, these patients um, do well and return to sports. Um, uh, however, there may be some laxity of the ACL and this may be because of some stretch or plastic deformation of the ACL that occurs at the time of injury. So what are the treatment recommendations 2020? I think if you have a type one fracture, uh, we all tend to treat this closed, either cast uh, or brace knee immobilizer immobilization. Um, type two or three fractures, I think it's very reasonable to do a closed reduction plus minus aspiration of the knee if there's a large hemarthrosis. 
Uh, I think some of these um, uh, may reduce close and extension or slight flexion and then can be treated closed. I think many of these do not reduce, uh, particularly the type three fractures. Um, and then this proceeds to surgical treatment, open or arthroscopic reduction with internal fixation. Um, when you get to that, the fixation options really um, center on cannulated epiphyseal screws versus suture fixation. Um, this is a video on the left um, showing cannulated screw fixation. So we're using an, an accessory supermedial or superlateral um, portal. Um, these are guide wires for the 4.0 millimeter cannulated screws. Um, we're now checking our reduction anteriorly, medially, and laterally to make sure we have anatomic reduction. We also check this with x-ray fluoroscopy during surgery. I think the guide wires are fine to cross the physis. You don't want the screws to cross the physis. Um, so you can see the heads here of the epiphyseal cannulated screws. In this case, we use two. Um, because of a big fragment. We would then wanna move the knee to make sure we're not having any impingement, also to make sure our fixation is stable so we can have early motion of the knee. Now, on the right, the video is showing uh, suture fixation. So this is a very small fragment of chondroepiphysis. Um, this would not be appropriate for screw fixation. Um, we've drilled um, some tunnels, uh, our guide wires, um, and these are um, Houston suture passers. We've passed sutures through the base of the ACL and this bone or chondral epiphyseal piece. Uh, and then we tie these sutures over the drill holes over a, a, a bony, um, uh, over the bone on the tibia. Again, we want to move the knee to make sure we've got stable fixation and we can start uh, early motion. One advantage of um, suture fixation, as you saw here, is you can um, tighten the ACL uh, as well, which may help with that plastic deformation. So let's talk a little bit about screw versus suture fixation, which is better. Um, if we look at the biomechanical studies, and there have been a few of these, um, suture fixation tends to be stronger than screw fixation, uh, although screw fixation is still probably in the clinically important um, uh, uh, phase in terms of uh, fixation strength. Um, if we look at clinical studies, we have studies looking at screw fixation only, which show good results. We have studies looking at suture fixation only, um, which show good results. Um, when we look at comparative study, there's a group of studies that found no clinical difference between screw and suture fixation. Um, actually, a systematic review performed by Gons and Ted Ganley's group um, found also no difference between screw and suture fixation, and they found no difference in results between open or arthroscopic treatment. Um, we uh, performed a comparative study. We presented at POSNA in 2017 and was published in uh, OJSM um, last year, 2019. We looked at um, 38 suture fixation and 33 um, screw fixation cases fairly evenly split, average age was 11.9. Most of these patients were male uh, and the median follow-up was 26 months. Um, this shows the demographics of our um, comparative population. Um, and then these are our results. And so there was an increased rate uh, trend to complications in screw fixation compared to suture fixation. This was mostly hardware removal and there was an increased trend to increase knee instability in the screw fixation. So we found uh, using functional outcome scores return to sports, no different in, difference in clinical outcomes, um, but suture fixation had important trends to decrease rates of arthrofibrosis, um, complications, particularly hardware removal, uh, removal and decreased rates of subsequent instability. Rehabilitation, I think, is very important after these injuries. So we want to protect weight bearing, but we also want to get the knee moving. Um, I tend to use a brace and, and move them right away instead of uh, a cast uh, or a period uh, where they're um, uh, not moving. So I move them typically zero to 30 degrees in the first two weeks and zero to 90 degrees are now actually full motion um, from week two to week six. Uh, one of the main complications of this fracture is stiffness. And so if we see stiffness, I think it's important to get on it early. So less than three months with physical therapy and dynamic splinting. If greater than three months, um, we proceed to a gentle manipulation, arthroscopy with lysis of adhesions. 
Um, this has been a, a vexing complication for us, and it's something we've um, tried to study. Um, we published this paper, the first paper in 2011, looking at all pediatric knee surgery, so 933 cases, and we found a prevalence of 8% in terms of stiffness and arthrofibrosis, risk factors being female, older patients, and those having meniscal repair. Um, specifically for tibial spine fracture in a multicenter study published in 2010, we found that the rates varied widely from 4 to 3 35% um, across different centers, and a risk factor was a mobilization. Um, we published in 2016 a study looking at dynamic splinting for stiffness, uh, and we found improvement in 84% of patients and avoiding surgery in almost 60% of patients. Um, so we use dynamic splinting frequently. And if it does come to surgery with arthroscopy, lysis of adhesions, and manipulation under anesthesia, uh, we found improvement with full range of motion in 90% of these patients. It's important that that manipulation be gentle. This is a case uh, example that I think is illustrative. Um, this was a patient treated elsewhere with open reduction of a displaced tibial spine fracture, and then they were placed in a cast. So this is unusual and, and probably a setup um, to have stiffness in the knee. Um, they had a manipulation um, for lack of flexion at the outside institution, um, and they got flexion, but now had difficulty extending the knee, so they were refer referred to us. The first thing um, we did was um, get some x-rays. This is how they presented. Um, so they lacked flexion originally, they were manipulated, and now they're lacking extension. And the x-rays show a fracture through the distal femur um, from the manipulation. So I think the point here is that the scar tissue can be very stiff, um, the growth plate is cartilage and can be relatively weaker. Um, so these manipulations need to be gentle. I, I prefer to do an arthroscopic uh, lysis of adhesions prior to manipulation to avoid this complication. Um, so again, my goal here was to talk about intraarticular fractures of the knee, focusing kind of more in depth on the tibial spine fracture. I think the key points uh, are to talk about ACL versus tibial spine injuries. Um, closed reduction is certainly uh, an option for non-displaced fractures or those that reduced with extension. Um, open versus arthroscopic um, reduction internal fixation are both treatment options. Uh, for fixation, we have screw versus suture fixation. I would say the trend for us and for others is to suture fixation. Uh, and then importantly, think about rehabilitation, uh, moving the knee early to avoid stiffness. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Hey, that was a great uh, talk on uh, the spine. Very nice and thorough talk. I mean, uh, uh, as we as Ted brings up his uh, next PowerPoint, I had uh, a couple of quick questions. When you're putting the sutures, are you doing epiphyseal sutures or transphyseal sutures? Yes, I, you know, I think you can really do either, Chital. I think that the um, drill holes here are very small. They're about two millimeters. Um, and the suture passers are small. So I think it's okay to go across um, the proximal tibial physis. Um, for a while, we tried to do these um, drill holes just within the epiphysis. And I think you can do it. You need x-ray and fluoroscopy. Um, it's a little bit more um, work and a little bit more futz. Um, uh, so I think some of us stay within the epiphysis. Some of us go trans on the tibia. Yeah, you know, um, I, I usually prefer screws for most of the uh, cases here. And I'd read, uh, you know, some articles even by you on screws. So what was the reason to move from uh, screws to sutures? Was it based on your studies that showed better res clinical results? Yeah, I, you know, I still do screws uh, sometimes as well. I think um, one advantage of sutures is you can do it sort of for all cases. So in some cases, like the type four, you have a comminuted fracture. In some cases, like the video I showed, there's a very small piece of bone or it's the chondroepiphysis. So those aren't necessarily amenable to screws. I think another advantage of the sutures is um, you're able to snug up the ACL. Uh, and so my sense is that the knees are a little bit tighter than the screw fixation knees. And we saw that um, in our comparative study uh, as well, a trend to um, less instability in the suture fixation. And then 
Um, removal of hardware. So with suture, you don't have to do a second surgery to remove the screws. Um, some people leave the screws in place. Um, some people routinely take the screws out. So, but that may be an advantage to tall as well. But when you're saying- Can we have one question from delegate? Uh, somebody has asked uh, any recommendation when to do MRI or CT in suspected ligamentous injury? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think that if you see a tibial spine fracture, almost by definition, the ACL will not be completely torn. Um, because if the ACL tore, then it won't get to the point where it avulses the intercondylar eminence. Um, so it's very rare to go in arthroscopically or open with a tibial spine fracture and see a concurrent ACL injury. I think the place that MRI can be helpful is to look for associated injuries like meniscus, articular cartilage, entrapment of the tibial spine. You know, for me, if I'm going to treat it arthroscopically, I'll see that anyway. So I don't usually get an MRI scan. Uh, if I'm going to treat it closed, though, I think that that is a change in practice for me. I will now get an MRI scan to look um, for those uh, factors. Uh, Ted, I'd be interested to see how your recent study has changed um, your practice patterns. Yeah, I, I follow that same, uh, those same principles, Min. So uh, if they're treated uh, non-operatively, in an MRI, if you see something uh, that you uh, will need to fix based on meniscus tear, it's a little more rare um, if it's treated non-operatively because the injury, I think, is tends not to be quite as severe. Um, and so uh, I follow exactly those same principles. Ethel, can I ask a question? Uh, to all yes. the faculties. You know, we are talking about arthroscopic treatment for uh, intraarticular fracture, especially tibial fine fracture. So what if you are in a remote part of India where arthroscopy is not available and you get a child with a tibial spine injury, is it okay to do an open surgery and fix it? And if you do it open, how will your technique change and what are the tips for an open surgery for tibial spine fracture? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I, I totally think it's um, fine to do it open versus arthroscopic. It depends a little bit on <clears throat> equipment, as you said, uh, surgeon experience. Um, so, you know, uh, Ted uh, can talk about his systematic review, which include the comparison of open versus arthroscopic, and there wasn't a difference in outcome. You know, I think if you're going open, you typically uh, can do it through a parapatellar incision. You don't need a large incision that flips the patella. Um, I think uh, through the open incision, Z retractors or some sort of retractors are very good um, to give you exposure to the intercondylar notch. I think you can certainly pass sutures um, through uh, open technique, or you can certainly do screws um, through an open technique as well. I do think the harder part with the open technique is sort of, you know, seeing uh, if you have to treat a meniscus tear or something uh, towards the back of the knee, but that's actually very uncommon. The most common meniscal problems are in the front of the knee, which you can see very well open. Uh, Ted, do you want to comment on your systematic review, which looked at open and arthroscopic? Yeah, so I, I would say I agree with uh, everything Min said, and I would uh, simply add that um, the systematic review said no increased incidence of stiffness or arthrofibrosis. And my rationale behind that is that I think some of the, to me, the triple crown of stiffness can be patients that are diagnosed and there's some delay in getting to the operating room. So they, they get it at a point at which the knee is stiff and then prolonged arthroscopic uh, treatment. Uh, and then if folks are not confident with their fixation, prolonged post-op immobilization after that. Um, I do think that treating open, there is no um, uh, significant uh, soft tissue, um, uh, uh, basically saline into the soft tissues uh, for prolonged periods of time. That could be a reason uh, why there's perhaps, uh, they're not seeing any increased uh, incidence of arthrofibrosis with those patients. And, um, and the um, uh, incidence of union uh, was the same. So uh, Todd Milbrandt from, uh, uh, the U.S. Has, has a really nice series of excellent outcomes with open treatment. I think that's a perfectly reasonable option to fix those uh, fractures. Great. Um, so, Ted, we can go ahead with your next talk, which is on uh, overuse conditions of the knee. Okay. Um, thanks, Chital. Um, so, again, uh, I have, believe I have no disclosures uh, relative to this talk. Um, I'll be addressing apophysitis. 
um, um, OCD lesions, um, a little bit on stress fractures uh, and uh, touching base on injury prevention as well. Um, as an introduction, um, there's certainly been an increased uh, participation in organized uh, sports in our uh, younger generation. Uh, growth spurts can lead to loss of flexibility, apophyseal weakening with rapid clonal expansion of chondrocytes, uh, high prevalence in the uh, athletes you see shown and listed here. Um, and then there's certainly a number of uh, areas where we'll see overuse injuries. I'm going to focus on uh, OCD, Oshka Sauter, Cindy Glarson, and some stress uh, fracture principles, basically. Uh, touching base on apophyseal injury. Um, we know that uh, there's uh, chronic repetitive microtrauma with kids with their sports, their rapid uh, growth spurts, decreased flexibility. And at the tibial tubercle, it's uh, Oshkut Slaughters is the, uh, is the name originally uh, described uh, from physicians in the US and uh, Switzerland simultaneously. Uh, over 100 years ago. The etiology, if it's, if it's at the inferior pole of the patella, it's Cindy Larson Johansson condition. Uh, it's an apophysitis, a stress reaction that can fill with fibrous tissue, fibrocartilage. Uh, the, uh, we like for patients to point uh, to the uh, point of maximal tenderness. Um, this was a, uh, a physician drawing, but I, I will actually give the kids uh, in my office a pen and have them circle the area that's uh, the worst for them. Um, it's at the tibial tubercle apophysis for Oshkut Slaughters. Clinical exam is tenderness and quad contracture. And, and one of the things is, I don't know that uh, anyone that's on this uh, uh, here is not going to be diagnosing Oshkut Slaughters. So, so what are the kind of techniques and tricks that I can, uh, can help say that have been helpful for me? Uh, differential diagnosis, uh, patellar tendonitis, uh, pes bursitis, osteoidosioma, Brody's abscess. Um, we'll get radiographs. Uh, if there's atypical findings, it's sending Lars Larson Johansson, it's at the inferior pole of the patella. Uh, if it's at Oshkut Slaughters, it'll be certainly at the tibial tubercle. Uh, management, quad stretching, ice after sports activity modification. So I would say for many people, their uh, pediatric medical ABCs is airway, breathing, and circulation. I say for patients, for me, it's activity modification, bracing, and continued rehabilitation for this condition. Activity modification, what, is mo what are the ways that I address this? I tell kids that it's okay to play sports, but if they have pain and limping, they have to discontinue. That's Mother Nature's way. It's not my way, but Mother Nature's way. They say they have to discontinue the activities for the day. If they have pain and limping three to four days in a row, that's Nature's way saying they take, need to take a month off. Um, no sports during that time and simply work on their flexibility, core strengthening. B is bracing. Uh, there's rubbery type sleeves. You don't necessarily need patellar straps as in this case, uh, but neoprene sleeves can help the kids feel like it's the warmest day of the year, give them a bumper effect, but otherwise I think that's the least important of the three. Can, I, I use the term continued rehabilitation so they can work on flexibility. And I, I tell families like a diabetic takes their insulin three, four times a day, I want them to do their flexibility, uh, hamstrings, quadriceps, heel cords, treatment to avoid prolonged immobilization, irregular anti-inflammatory use. And perhaps none of that is, uh, is uh, uh, new information. I'll give a clinical scenario, however, that I've found helpful. Uh, Oshkut Sauters is the diagnosis that I picked up on. Dad was in with his son. Dad said his wife is worried, is it something dangerous here to find out the problem? Uh, my response was, it's not dangerous. Dad seemed relieved. I described what Oshkut Slaughters is. I felt like I gave a complete review. I was uh, really covering all bases. Uh, and then I said, it's, it's okay for you to go. However, dad didn't seem to be uh, listening when I was finishing up my talk. So I said, uh, what did I, can, can you repeat what I said? And his response was, it's not dangerous. You really don't know what it is and it's okay to go. And that to me highlighted um, that, you know, you need to communicate uh, not simply with uh, uh, the person in the room, you need to make sure that everybody in the family has that information. So uh, I created a series of teaching sheets. They're on our hospital website and you can go to our sports page and get those. Uh, and uh, now I say after a complete discussion, it's not dangerous, please hand these forms to your spouse when you go home and it's okay to go. I'll even give them, if I need to get radiographs, I'll give them the form uh, and then I'll have them go to x-ray. By the time they've gotten to, from, back from x-ray, they've read it a few times and they're, they're fully well-versed in the condition so that that can uh, decrease the time of your visit. Um, surgical issues, if there's unresolved cases, surgical excision of the ossicle, it's rare. Um, we have about 70,000 patients uh, a year through our system and uh, I tend to get these kinds of things, but I'll only have to do that about once uh, every year and a half or so. So it's, it's pretty rare in our system. 
um, take home points. Uh, I find the educational teaching sheets can educate everyone, not just the patient, but both parents, physical therapists, pediatricians, coaches, et cetera. Uh, so they've been a useful tool for me and hopefully that's uh, helpful um, for you as well. It's, it's also patients come for a second opinion. They, you can show them you're following our uh, protocol and, and that they're following those things uh, that can uh, been helpful for me. Clinical scenario, he's a 13 year old catcher. So we'll move to a slightly uh, different topic here. Their initial presentation, their 13 year old female, otherwise healthy, uh, fell and hit her right knee, went to the ED with the uh, swelling and pain, but it didn't seem to be uh, terribly uh, uh, painful. X-ray, knee immobilizer crutches, discontinued to follow up. Doctor said something about an OCD lesion. So um, OCD, um, our, our OCD study group described that as a focal idiopathic alteration of subchondral bone with instability, disruption of adjacent articular cartilage. So why am I covering that in an overuse talk? Well, chronic rep repetitive microtrauma can be considered one of the uh, potential etiologies for this condition, which literally means osteobone chondrocartilage and dissecans to dissect or separate, described by Koenig um, over 100 years ago. So um, again, the, the, uh, the rationale behind this, is it chronic re repetitive microtrauma? Is it, a, is it a vascular phenomenon? Is there a genetic component, some combination of those? Um, and the, you can see the article to the right. We dissected out some pediatric cadavers and sent those to Minnesota. Uh, and I, uh, I credit uh, the hard work of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kevin Shea uh, for that. I've been a contributor, but he's been the point person for that. Um, and they uh, showed that there's a bit of a watershed area in that uh, lateral aspect femoral condyle. And this is an arthroscopic photo of a, a patient of mine. And then in the, uh, in the next image, you'll see that I will uh, zoom into that area. So you can see where there's uh, uh, individual red cells traversing the blood vessel there, but that shows that some of that uh, vascular supply, it, it visually you don't even uh, see it quite as well uh, at that uh, avascular zone that's shown in the image on the right. Um, so who is this uh, occurring? This is the 13 year old catcher. We're gonna, so uh, you can get a young 13 year old female or an older 13 year old female. And you can see the OCD lesions can look different in those and the degree of uh, closure of the physes are different as well. Um, so this is a 14 year old uh, softball catcher uh, and we'll show that uh, combination of uh, conditions. Um, I found that that um, <clears throat> article and that blood supplies helped me in my dialogue with patients and families. These can be people that have seen one or two other physicians before they see you. And I'll describe OCD as an altered or less or non-viable bone. Uh, or you can make an argument if you want it to be extreme, you can say it's dead bone. And our task is to make dead bone become living bone. And if you ask that of any other doctors in the body, um, cardiovascular surgeons and the heart, the people addressing the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, they'll say you can't bring anything back to life. But we're fortunate in orthopedics that, that uh, we can stimulate uh, lesser viable bone to become viable. So I uh, say sometimes surgery is like CPR on your knee. So we can't necessarily guarantee 100% muffler shop type guarantee that we're gonna get return of blood supply every time. Sometimes it needs more than one surgical procedure uh, and other, there are very varying ways to stimulate that bone. A case, OCD case, will show here of an of uh, open growth plates, intact um, OCD lesion, uh, and of those that are not marginated, uh, we'll treat them with uh, uh, non-operative measures. Hopefully, they're healed. But if they're not healed, we will we will then proceed to to drilling, um, and they can be trans or retroarticular. Again, this is patients with uh, wide open uh, uh, growth plates, uh, and so um, we will show here uh, goals. Uh, therefore, to enhance uh, blood supply. Um, for intact, stable, open growth plates. Um, and they can be appear arthroscopically as a cue ball appearance or a shadow appearance. Um, and so these intact, stable, open growth plates. Um, what I'd like to do is I'll actually use a little core needle biopsy. <clears throat> it keeps that um, um, C wire, K wire from wrapping on the fat padding can help, help get you these perfect circles. So, so a little brief video clip of that shown. Um, and you can see examples, you've uh, obtained some uh, uh, fat droplets, bone marrow, so that you've, again, created that uh, perfect circle. Um, for drilling transarticular, I'll use a 0.45 millimeter K wire as opposed to a 6.2. Um, when do you add bone graft for patients? If they have closed growth plates, it's marginated. If they have cysts, these ovoid bodies. Um, and so in those cases, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll address retroarticular drilling. But again, if they have a compelling reason, um, larger against cysts, uh, uh, I will add um, some, uh, you can even add bone. So this, this retroarticular uh, uh, drilling gives you advantage of, of drilling alone 
or changing a course uh, mid procedure to add bone graft. You can take that from the proximal tibia, distal femur, iliac crest, um, and you can over drill uh, and then simply uh, uh, take bone from any other parts and, and add it from uh, adding it from the back as opposed to transarticular uh, uh, drilling or addition of uh, bone graft, which we typically use in uh, trapdoor lesions, et cetera. Uh, OCD principles, remember alignment, uh, osteotomies for those with close, close growth plays, guided growth for those with open can help offload the affected joints. Um, and again, we address those uh, patients uh, for operatively when they've, uh, they're symptomatic juvenile lesions that have failed conservative trial or those that uh, predicted physeal closure within six to 12 months. Um, now this same catcher will say as opposed to the younger catcher, and then we'll have an older baseball catcher. Um, and you can see again, now the growth plates are uh, uh, closing closed. Um, you can see this is your MRI lesion. And in this instance, it's a trapdoor lesion. So you can see the cartoon illustration on the left, the arthroscopic photo, and then an open um, uh, incision on the right addressing that trapdoor. Now the first, uh, this patient uh, that was, uh, had the trapdoor lesion that, that was actually addressed arthroscopically. You can see preparing the bed in the fragment, some marrow stimulation, although it looks pretty uh, uh, good, good blood supply. Um, and again, in the upper, that was a patient that was treated uh, arthroscopically um, with uh, headless compression screws. Uh, there are resorbable types. I tended like stainless. I will return. I will. I will return in four to six months and remove those. Um, but you can see a screw capture system. Mark showing the depth. I'll put those several millimeters beneath the articular cartilage. Um, and then again, that's the arthroscopic case. And here's an example of an open case, it's a different case, but one that was open. The trapdoor lesion is open. Bone graft in this case from the proximal tibia, you can see the red arrow. And those screws are recessed beneath the cartilage. Uh, and then I'll go back and remove those after. Sometimes the cartilage is very thick. It can be um, uh, because that, that uh, physeal, um, <clears throat> there's a, there's a physis uh, uh, just below the articular cartilage and the, and the cartilage gets paradoxically thicker. Um, so again, these are some screws that are in place. You can see the plain films. Uh, we use flathead screws if there's trace subchondral bone. And if there's sufficient subchondral bone, I'll use, uh, again, the headless um, reverse threaded uh, compression screws. Again, I tend to use metal over resorbable. Um, and then moving on to stress fractures, I'm not actually treating stress fractures surgically in the knee. So where am I treating stress fractures in the knee? Um, uh, surgically, again, that summation of, uh, of stresses, any, any one of which uh, itself would be uh, harmless. Uh, and then uh, you, can, you will get the classic complaints uh, and clinical exam, tenderness to palpation, the imaging, plain films, MR and bone scans. Uh, for, so most uh, in and around the knee, immobilization, six weeks rest, rehab, and where am I considering open reduction internal fixation for? Uh, Olecranon with radiolucency and throwers, the scaphoid, um, the femoral neck tension side, tibial shaft with that dreaded black line, um, and ORF for base of the fifth metatarsal. Again, this arrow shows a very proximal, but more, uh, I'll use it more in the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, those uh, more true Jones fractures. Uh, in terms of injury prevention, uh, we, we have ACL prevention programs to address uh, awareness, balance, flexibility for acute and overuse injuries. Um, and there's a ready, set, prevent um, uh, is, a, is a prevention program that we have for ACLs. Uh, but I, I tend to think of those not simply as ACL injury prevention programs, but I, I'd like to think of those as lo, uh, in the entire lower extremity. We've shown that they've been helpful for ankle sprains. Um, so the flexibility, uh, strength, and normalizer training, I think, is an application for both acute and overuse conditions as well. Um, I would say that uh, I was very fortunate to have attended your uh, POSICON meeting. Um, I told my wife uh, when we were there, I'm convinced I have Indian ancestry because I've always loved the food. Um, I have so many amazing friends. I love uh, basically uh, everyone I've known who's of Indian descent in medicine. My favorite people in the world, Min Coker, Chital. Uh, I have my, uh, the list of names goes on and on. Sankar, Patel, Pandya. Uh, I love the weddings. Uh, I love the conferences and I love the culture. And then I love the place when I was there. We were so uh, honored and thrilled uh, to be in India, just a phenomenal place. I added a few uh, overuse injuries when I was there, uh, perhaps Taj selfie wrist, spice market shoulder, uh, banquet dancer's hip and non-maker's knee. Now I'm not sure about those. You'll have to, you guys have the expertise, but those are potential conditions you can look for. Thank you so much for your time and happy to answer any questions. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great, uh, great talk and excellent last slides, uh, Ted. Uh, nice overview of overuse conditions. 
So um, I'll just, uh, uh, Min would come back with um, his uh, next uh, talk. Uh, in the meantime, um, you know, do you have a preference or how would you choose retrograde drilling versus, uh, you know, anti-grade drilling for your intact OCD fragments? Do you have, is it a preference or is it based on any evidence? So um, I actually credit uh, uh, Min and his junior colleague, uh, Ben Hayworth. Ben led uh, trans versus retroarticular uh, drilling um, uh, in, in a prospective randomized study. It was one of only two studies listed with NIH within orthopedics when it was first submitted. Um, and that's not, the data is not fully uh, out yet, but it seems like the transarticular drilling actually fared a little better than retroarticular drilling. Uh, perhaps uh, it's, uh, I don't have a perfect answer for that. So I tend to, if it's an intact lesion, I tend to um, use transarticular drilling. If I feel like it's one that I possibly might add some bone graft, it's a little larger, um, then, I'll, then I'll use retroarticular drilling. I think both are excellent. There was actually, to be fair, both of those got excellent outcomes. Uh, and I think either one is reasonable. I mean, are you concerned when you're doing like uh, if you do retrograde drilling about the holes that you leave in the cartilage or they are not big enough to be concerned about it? Yeah, I, I think they're quite small. So I typically drill with a 0 0.045 C wire. Um, and I think with that, it, these are very small um, drill holes through the cartilage. Uh, and then when you go back uh, in, um, you know, you can uh, either you see nothing uh, or you see just very small um, sort of speckles of fibrocartilage. So I think if you stay with a small C wire, I think it's okay. I think you can also drill through the intercondylar notch where there isn't articular cartilage. Um, so you're kind of coming at the lesion from multiple angles. And, and in that case, it's sort of quote free because you're not going through the articular cartilage. Good. That was Kramer, do you have a couple of audience questions? Yes, uh, she's on, uh, there is a one question by Dr. Babulkar. He's asking, can type 3 be treated conservatively by long leg plaster? ACL, I guess. Are you um, about can, oh, spine? Oh, yes. I will just, tibial uh, level gen spine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think you can try to treat a type 3. So in a type 3 tibial spine, you can extend the knee or slight flexion. Uh, aspirate if there's a large hemarthrosis. If the fracture reduces anatomically, then I think it's okay to treat it um, in, a, in a cast or a brace. Uh, I think the problem is that most type threes, um, I've had very few type threes in my experience that will actually reduce. Um, and so if you do that and it doesn't reduce, then I think um, you're heading to open or arthroscopic reduction. Yeah, I tend to, you know, fix all displaced fractures with uh, surgery because the reason I don't like cast is one is that, you know, obviously if you can't get it reduced, but the second thing is that the arthrofibrosis rates, you know, as that study has shown that if you have to cast them a bit longer, I'm concerned that I may lose some motion. And my, my goal is, when I'm treating this fracture is to mobilize them early so I can get a good fixation and mobilize them. So I, that's why I don't prefer to treat it conservative. But you know, I'll be. Uh, it'd be interesting to get your views, Ted. And um, I mean, you know, Shelbourne had a paper where he would let these mal unite, you know, these fractures, and if they have an extension block, he would go back later, like after three or four months, and shave that, the, shave the prominent part of it. And he had not reported any, like you know, ACL issues with it. I, I don't prefer that, that kind of treatment where you purposely let it mal unite. But he treated a lot of these conservative and reported that he would just let that heal in an, you know, in a, in that position and then go and shave it off if needed. Yeah, I, there, you know, I have a question for Ted. Yeah. Oh, let's, sorry. Let him, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Sandeep, let, if we can answer this question, then we can go to the next. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think that's hard to deal with, Shital, when you've got the malunion with the piece of bone, um, you know, proximal in the knee. Because uh, in those situations, it usually does prevent extension. Um, if the fracture goes into the tibial plateau, you now have a step off in the joint. Um, it's hard to burr down that bone without buggering up the ACL. So I, I think it's, it's more challenging than it seems. I did, a bit anecdotal, but I did have one patient was sent to me uh, a year and a half out. Um, uh, they were Asian descent immigrant language barriers, but they were treated non-operatively, markedly displaced tibial spine. Um, it developed then an OCD lesion or uh, traumatic injury on the femoral condyle, and they had a 
contracture. Uh, and that said a year and a half later, now Dr. Ganley to address knee motion. And I was thinking, well, in an ideal uh, scenario, we, we would have addressed all of those things simultaneously. Yeah, Sandeep, what, we can take one question before we move on. Yeah, the there part. are a couple of questions. Uh, when you treat the tibial spine avulsions conservatively, people are asking, what is the position of the knee in the plaster? Ah, if you give it in hyperextension, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's whatever position it? reduces the fracture. So it's. I think the answer is either extension uh, or um, 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Um, and if you look at the tibial spine, um, if you look at the ACL, which is inserting on the tibial spine, um, there is tension on in, in all ranges of knee motion with the anterior band and the uh, intermedial band and the posterior lateral band. It seems like the least um, tension on the ACL is at about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. And so that, that may be one factor that allows for reduction. If the fracture goes into the um, plateau, medial, lateral, tibial plateau, and you extend the knee, then the femoral condyles will push on the plateau. Uh, and so that's the type of fracture that may reduce an extension. But I would certainly not put them in hyperextension, Sandeep. That's not a physiologic position. So, you know, extension or okay. a little bit of flexion is okay, but not hyperextension. Agreed. Agreed. All right. One uh, question, we can move so, on. Yeah, yeah let's just move on. Um, Okay, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead, Tarot. The question is that many times we see uh, uh, children with osteochondral fractures which present very late. You know, the imaging don't show anything. MRI is not done. And by the time you see, the fragment is loose and, you know, it, it's completely misshapen to the crater, which you can't fix it back. What's the natural history when, you know, such a in such a lesion, you excise the fragment and just leave it alone? What will happen to the knee joint of the child? So... Ted and Min, you know, uh, opinion from both of you. And you want to start? I, yeah. I, I would say that uh, basically um, if, if you have bone on the back of that uh, at any point, I have no problems. Uh, and, and I think Min published on some of that, that uh, you, can, you can taper that piece down and secure it. Um, even if it's early, you, we've shown that you can secure chondral only fragments in very young patients um, I had a chondral shear, which was so large and it was chronic. I secured chondral only and it healed. So uh, it, the younger they are, the better things can heal. Many yeah, I would, I would agree. So I think even in chronic loose bodies, if, the, if it has bone and um, it, the cartilage, articular cartilage looks good, you can take it out. It's grown. It tends to grow in the knee uh, when it's a loose body. So you have to take it out reshape it, put it back like a jigsaw puzzle and fix it. Um, but sometimes it, you know, the piece is just bad. The cartilage is all beaten up and the bone is um, very avascular. And so then you have to take those out. Um, if they're small lesions, the patient, you know, might do fine um, just taking it out. If they're bigger lesions, then they're at high risk of arthritis, uh, like over two, you know, centimeters. And so now you're talking about chondral resurfacing techniques like a osteochondral allograft or autologous chondrocyte implantation or Macy. So kind of more complex techniques. Excellent. Let's move on to, uh, to Min's uh, talk and then uh, we'll uh, uh, answer some questions during case discussion. Ted, if you could stop sharing. Great, thanks. And then I'll go. Okay. Chital, are you seeing this? Yes, perfect. All right, great. Um, so uh, thanks again uh, for the opportunity um, to be uh, here in India um, virtually. Uh, so in this talk, um, I was asked to talk about uh, tibial tubercle fractures and patella fractures. Um, again, my disclosures are shown here. I don't think there's a conflict um, with any of the material in this talk. Um, so the tibial tubercle apophysis, we'll start with, the tubercle apophysis fractures uh, are not uncommon. They represent uh, uh, half to almost 3% of all epiphyseal or apophyseal injuries. Um, this, is, uh, this can be a Salter-Harris III um, extension into the proximal tibial physeal fracture. It can be the sequelae of a prior osgood schlatter lesion. It tends to happen in a narrow age range, kind of um, like the Talot fractures or the 
triplane fractures. That was a question Sandeep had talked about uh, at the beginning of this um, session. Um, but it tends to happen in this adolescent um, time frame, and it tends to happen in jumpers. It, it can be an eccentric contraction of the quad, um, and it creates just such a powerful force that you can avulse the tibial tubercle apophysis. The most common sport that we see is basketball and, and probably volleyball uh, as well. Um, so if we think about Osgood Schlatter's lesion, which Ted just talked about, um, versus uh, tibial tubercle fracture, Osgood Schlatter's is sort of a chronic overuse injury. Tibial tubercle fractures are a more acute type of injury. Um, Osgood Schlatter's, they've got more mild symptoms. They're able to stand, um, uh, whereas in tibial tubercle, it's a much more dramatic presentation. Um, there is a different, there is an overlap though. So we do see patients with tibial, tibial tubercle fractures who had pre-existing uh, osgood Schlatter symptoms. Um, the development of the tibial tubercle apophysis is important to remember. So we have an early stage where you won't see anything on x-ray. It's all cartilage. This is typically up to age eight and within to nine. The next stage is where we see a secondary center of ossification in the tubercle apophysis. I'm about age eight to 13. The third stage is that the apophysis coalesces with the epiphysis. Uh, and this is typically in early adolescence. Uh, and then everything fuses and that's in later adolescence. Um, I actually think that this staging of the tibial tubercle apophysis can be very helpful. Um, this is just a research uh, spotlight, um, but we looked at almost 300 of our patients who were um, evenly split between male and female uh, and divided into different age ranges. Um, we looked at their skeletal age from the hand and wrist atlas of Grulich and Pyle, and then we classified their tibial tubercle apophysis stage into these four stages. So again, cartilage only, uh, apophysis uh, of the tibial tubercle, the apophysis and the epiphysis merge, and then um, all the physes close. Um, this is a bar and whisker uh, graph, which shows a fairly tight um, distribution in terms of um, their skeletal age um, from uh, stage one being young, stage two being young, stage three being adolescents, and stage four being um, later adolescents. Um, so these apophyseal staging um, uh, stages may help us with certain decisions, like if we're seeing an ACL patient with open growth plates and we don't have a hand uh, x-ray for bone age, uh, my sense is that the tibial tubercle apophysis stage three and four represent adolescent patients, whereas um, one and two prepubescent, you might think of a growth plate sparing type of approach as, as compared to a transficeal uh, type of approach in an apophysis three stage patient. Um, the classification, so now moving back to apophyseal fractures, the classification is shown here. So Ogden um, defined a type one fracture uh, as going through the apophysis, a type two fracture between the apophysis and the epiphysis. Um, the type three fracture goes through the tibial epiphysis, so is now an intraarticular fracture. Um, we describe this type four fracture that goes through the apophysis, across the physis, and then back out the metaphysis posteriorly. So that's the type four fracture. And then a type five fracture has been uh, added, um, which does both. So it goes through the apophysis, across the tibial physis, out the back like a type four injury, but then also has a component that splits into the joint. So the type ones through three were the classic uh, type four uh, and type five have been added, which probably represent higher energy injuries. Um, so the treatment for tibial tubercle apophysis fractures, uh, non-displaced fractures, um, we typically treat in a long leg cast and extension or a knee mobilizer. Um, displaced fractures um, typically are treated with um, closed reduction or open reduction uh, and usually internal fixation. Um, so for internal fixation, we, we typically use lag screws um, anterior to posterior. I like to use cancella screws that do not engage the posterior tibial um, cortex to avoid potential injury to neurovascular structures. 
um, but it has been described as bicortical screws as well. If you have more than three years of growth remaining, you can use smooth K wires, but remember that's less common because these fractures are typically happening in adolescent patients nearing skeletal maturity. Um, and, and then you need to follow growth afterwards, particularly in the younger patients. If they have a growth disturbance of the tibial tubercle apophysis, that's gonna result in a hyperextension or recurvatum uh, type of deformity. Uh, and then the other um, uh, a snake to be aware of is a compartment syndrome. Um, that's been well described with tibial tubercle apophysis fractures, particularly higher energy injuries. Um, the literature uh, has a, a number of tibial tubercle apophysis fracture studies um, that were relatively small. Uh, we wanted to kind of look into this in more depth. Um, so this was a research study um, that we presented at POSNA um, and is now currently impressed. So we looked at a larger group of tibial tubercle um, apophyseal fractures in children and adolescents. I'll just highlight a few areas. Um, we looked at 236 fractures in 228 patients over a 15 year period at our institution. Um, the vast majority of these are male patients. You can see 86%. Um, the mean age was 14.3. Um, the BMI is shown here. 31% of these patients had prior Osgood Slaughter's um, symptoms. Uh, most of these 86% were from a sports-related mechanism of injury. The breakdown in terms of the Ogden classification is shown here. So the most common type of fracture was the type 3 fracture. This is the fracture that goes across the apophysis and also the epiphysis into the joint. Um, the second most common fracture classification was the type 1 fracture, um, and that's the one within the apophysis. Um, Compartment syndrome we saw in 2% of these fractures. Um, if we look here, this is the classification system as well. Females most commonly sustained lower um, complexity fractures, so lower Ogden classification, with 56% of females having a type 1 fracture, so a fracture of the apophysis only. Um, Osgood Schlatter's also was pre existing, Osgood Schlatter's was associated with less complex fractures. Um, type 2 and type 3 fractures were associated with um, higher BMI, so heavier patients. Um, and then if we looked at the type 4 fractures, um, three of the type 4 fractures, so 11% were associated with compartment syndrome. So this was the fracture pattern that was most commonly associated with compartment syndrome. Again, this is the one that goes across the apophysis, across the physis, and then back through the metaphysis posteriorly. Um, uh, we looked at our surgical technique, screw fixation in 90% of patients, um, uh, other techniques in 3% of patients, um, close reduction with screw fixation, which is uh, a possible treatment in 7% of patients. Um, a quarter of the patients underwent fasciotomies. Most of these were prophylactic and of the anterior compartment fascia. Um, in terms of complication, there was one iatrogenic injury to the popliteal artery um, from a bicortical screw, um, and then six cases uh, of uh, infection, one requiring irrigation and debridement. Um, at follow-up minimum six months, um, we found that 57% of the patients went, underwent reoperation. Almost all of these cases were hardware removal, so screw removal. These screws are not tend not to be well tolerated in the apophysis. Um, uh, Non-union was very uncommon. Um, a leg length discrepancy or recurvatum was seen, but also was very uncommon. Return to sports rates uh, were high, 86%. Um, and in the non-operative treatment, which were lower energy injuries, 94% of these patients um, went on to sports. So our conclusion was um, this was a common sports-related injury, uh, almost always in adolescent males. Um, they're associated with Og Osgood Schlatter's disease, um, not uncommonly, 31%, um, higher BMI. There's a small but real risk of compartment syndrome, particularly in type 4 fractures. Um, and when treated surgically or non surgically, most of these patients will return to sports. So now um, we'll switch to patella fracture. Patella fracture is relatively uncommon in children. So if we look at series of all fractures in children, you can see 
uh, one to 5% of the fractures are patella fractures. And this is different than uh, in adults. Reasons why it's less common in children, um, there's more cartilage cushioning for direct blow, probably lower magnitude of the extensor mechanism force, greater mobility um, of the patella. Um, the anatomy uh, of the patella, it's a secondary center of ossification at age three to six. There's multiple ossicles that coalesce late, usually by age, later teenage um, years. Um, we can see the bipartite patella most commonly superior lateral. Um, classification of patella fractures is usually location on the patella uh, and the type of fracture. Lower pole fractures we need to differentiate from chronic Syndig, Larson, Johansson sim symptoms. Um, uh, upper lateral pole uh, fractures we need to differentiate from bipartite patella. Um, the sleeve fracture, which is unique to children, um, we tend to see in pre-adolescence, so eight to 12 year old um, patients. And in this fracture, um, the patellar tendon is, is attached um, to the distal pole of the patella. This may be a very small piece of bone as shown here in the x-ray, um, but a large piece of cartilage and typically is displaced. So the treatment for patella fractures if non-displaced um, is closed treatment. Um, displaced uh, transverse fractures like adult, um, typically with a tension band construct, usually now screws um, with a tension band construct. Marginal fractures can be excised and osteochondral fractures, um, often associated with patellofemoral dislocation, we fix if they're large fragments. Here's an example of that. So this is a 14-year-old female with a kneecap dislocation. You can see a very long, on x-ray, a very large piece of bone from the medial patella facet. This is what it looks like at arthroscopy. Um, we proceed to a medial uh, patellar arthrotomy. Um, we jigsaw the piece back. Here we fixed it um, with screws, which we later took out. And this is at the time uh, of taking out the screws, showing healing of that fragment. Um, this is the other place you'll see the osteochondral fragment. So you see a large piece of cartilage and bone here. Um, it comes from the lateral femoral condyle, so from the um, trochlear groove just distal. Um, these often also can be large um, fragments that we um, put back. So this is uh, an arthrotomy lateral peripatella, putting the fragment back with screws, and this is um, the fragment at the time of screw removal. Um, this was a case actually that um, I just operated on yesterday. Um, and this patient initially had a patellar sleeve fracture in 2011. He was 10 years old. So here's his x-ray, classic patellar sleeve, small piece of bone. You see the patella alta. This was treated with open reduction and fixation through drill holes and also metal suture anchor fixation. Um, he went on to heal this. Um, this was in 2011 and now in um, 2020, he's a 19-year-old college football player who's having some patellofemoral pain uh, and crepitus. His MRIs are shown here um, with some chondromalacia. Um, there's some artifact on this MRI because of the metal anchors. Um, so we took him back actually yesterday um, for an arthroscopy of the knee. Uh, and the inf inferior patella pole is shown here on the bottom picture where there is some chondral fraying and chondral injury. So we smoothed this up and there were some chondral loose bodies. And then the superior pole of the patella had good articular cartilage. Um, uh, and and uh, I just thought it was interesting to get 11 year follow up uh, on this patient. So in, in this 15 minutes, uh, again, the topics were tibial tubercle fracture uh, and patella fracture. I think with tibial tubercle fracture, um, we've learned that osgood Schlatter's is not uncommon as pre-existing. Um, those injuries tend to be lower fracture uh, uh, severity types. Um, beware of the type four fracture. That's the one that seems to be associated most commonly with compartment syndrome. Um, think of screw fixation, K-wire fixation in younger patients. Um, patella fractures. Uh, I think in children, beware of the patella sleeve fracture. This is a articular cartilage injury with a small piece of bone. Uh, and thank you uh, very much again for the invitation to be here uh, and thank you for your attention. Great talk, Min. Um, uh, uh, we'll move on to the cases. I just one quick question on the patellar sleeve fracture. If it's a big articular fragment, like the articular cartilage fragment, how do you fix, the, like you can get the K-wires and tension bent 
the entire sleeve, but do you do any suture fixation on the articular side of the patella or you just let it go? I think it depends. And so typically, you know, you can do the drill holes or the ankle anchors for the uh, superior pole to inferior pole part. Um, oftentimes the cartilage almost kind of just jigsaw puzzles back into position. Um, and there's often a big retinacular rent uh, on either side of the patella. And so as you repair the soft tissues as well, um, you don't have to do much for the articular cartilage. I like to move the knee I'm really kind of stress it to see if it's stable. If there is a step off or it does look like the cartilage is moving, then um, I don't hesitate to add some bioabsorbable tacks. Um, you know, flip the patella, add some bioabsorbable tacks, which can help um, to fix down that cartilage fragment as well. Okay, great. We'll move on to the cases. Uh, let me just share my uh, screen. Um, okay, can you see the uh, screen? Yes. yes, we can see. Okay, all right. So uh, this is a case that was presented by, uh, by Hitesh. So um, uh, if you can unmute uh, Hitesh. So it's a metaphyseal distal femur fracture in a six-year-old. These are the initial x-rays. So if you look closely, it doesn't involve the epiphysis, so it's very, very close. So the, for the audience, the, uh, the uh, options are whether you would immobilize this with a uh, cast, reducing the GA with the plaster um, or with the, whether you would uh, fix it. Yeah, so we have 10 seconds for audience to answer this. Okay, so 75% uh, of the, uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, audience would like to fix this with cross K wires. So um, I'll just share um, the uh, the uh, what was done, and then we can get Hitesh to comment on it, and and also the uh, the faculty. So um, for this uh, particular case, um, the patient was treated conservative. Um, as you can see here, there is a little bit of a posterior translation of the distal fragment, and uh, this is six weeks uh, post op. The patient is six years old, um, and this is remodeling at um, at six months and. Um, and Hitesh, would you like to comment uh, on the audience uh, that they recommended um, to fix it with cross K wires? And would you do it? Would yeah. you have done anything differently? Oh, thanks, Ethan, for the sharing this case. Actually, this uh, if we go back to the first slide, the pre-op X-ray, yeah. Uh, if we see very closely, the fracture was displaced, but you can see that it's not translated or angulated only in sagittal plane. So, and the child is very young. So that's remodeling capacity is quite good. So we thought about if it would be little proximal fracture, yes, it will be a good idea to fix because it's potentially unstable fracture. But here it is very distal near to the physis. So we thought we can go ahead and put about a plaster. So the child was treated with only the above knee plaster for the six weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, a little bit unusual pattern. We don't see this too often. Um, any any comments, uh, Ted or Min? Yeah, I think it's an excellent case and an excellent example. Um, I know uh, our American residents would have um, also sort of said close reduction and, and wire fixation. And I think the, the principles here are you've got a young patient with lots of remodeling. Um, the remodeling is in the plane uh, of the deformity. The joint motion is in the plane of the deformity. Um, uh, and so I think this is, is certainly one that could be treated, um, you know, uh, non-operatively, even without reduction, just in, in cast fixation as was done here. It does require some conversation with the family because they see a bone that's displaced and, and they're concerned. And so it's helpful to have you know, posters or examples of fractures and young kids that have healed and have gone on to remodel and do very well. But I thought, I thought this was an excellent case because I think sometimes um, we forget that uh, the remodeling potential in children. I would just add that weekly follow-up I uh, would be uh, in favor of as well for this patient. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, like to, uh, you know, welcome Dr. Wilkins. Uh, he's, uh, he's also on the panel and he had uh, a comment uh, yeah, one of the ways that you can fix these is that you can use anti-grade nailing. You can get anti-grade, you can go down and 
put across the physis and actually apply, uh, have them spread there at the physis. So that's another one. And that keeps you from having the, the, um, the risk of putting it in the, in the joint. And so that's another way of fixing it is anti-grade uh, nailing. You elastic nailing is what you mean, sir? Well, you Please start. Yeah, you, know, you start proximally and carry your pins down into the across the physis, into the epiphysis, and they're smooth pins. Mm -hmm. And so you put them down into there, uh, and that will stabilize it. And so that actually keeps you from having the the risk of putting your pins through the joint. Uh, when you oh, okay, got it. When you when you say nails, you, I think you you meant K wires, right? Uh, coming from proximal to distal. Cross yeah, they're not well K wires or whatever yeah. type of uh, flexible nails that you use. Um, if you go you have to go across the physis, you may have to sharpen that pin because sometimes mm -hmm. if it's a blunt pin, it, it's a little hard to get it across the physis, uh, and that makes it a little bit difficult to pass. But that's another technique that I've used for these, and of course that gives you pretty good stability. And actually, you can get some earlier motion. With the pins, you can't get any earlier motion, cross pins. Yeah, I think the, the, the thing in, in this patient's favor is the young, young age, six year old. So I think, you know, uh, treating it conservatively. I think Dr. Slongo had a comment. Dr. Slongo, are you there? Okay, I'll move on to the, to the next case. So this is an 11 year old with a Salter one fracture of the distal femur. And the question is whether you would fix it, fix it or you would not fix it. So here is the x-ray. We have an audience poll here and you can, it's a Salter head is one fracture of the distal femur. It's in a good anatomic position. Whether you would treat this in a cast or whether you would um, reduce it further and then cast it or whether you would fix it with cross K wires. Okay, so we have, uh, you know, more than half of the audience would like to treat it with the cat. Um, so if this was displaced and this is the reduction, uh, Tad, would you would you accept the reduction? I it seems like it's okay. Would you still K wire it, or would you uh, would you just treat it with immobilization? So um, I'm not sure if you're allowed, but I'd. I'd kind of like some more views, if I could get some oblique views or if they had other uh, advanced imaging, I'd be uh, happy to see that. Some of these can be more uh, display, some kind, some kind of a uh, longitudinal split, sagittal split through the center. Uh, and, um, and you can pick up uh, some more information on that. Um, I would like that to be reduced a little more uh, than it is. Again, 11 years ago, you showed some spectacular remodeling um, earlier. I do think that um, I, I'd prefer a little more reduction um, on the uh, posterior transla translation of that uh, epiphyseal fragment. Um, and and I, I am wary of these liking to migrate in older patients. So I tend to lean toward reduction and fixation. Um, even in those that aren't significantly displaced, I tend to like to make sure they're anatomically aligned and fixed, but maybe I'm over treating based on your earlier case. Yeah, I mean, you know, I uh, that's I think that's a very important teaching point that you know, salt or one of the distal femur. If you're going to reduce them, it's better to fix it as well. And we'll just see what happened to this case, and then we can have a discussion if you would do anything different. So this is his three months post-op injury. It wasn't fixed. The fracture was well reduced initially, but loss reduction, and um, now went into um, uh, an extension deformity. Uh, so the point is that uh, you know, not just uh, you know, loss of reduction, it's, you know, high, uh, higher rates of physal arrest with these fractures um, and fixation could decrease at uh, those rates. Um, this patient luckily did not have a physal arrest and went on to remodel these, this fracture. We don't see this too often um, here in the U.S. We end up, you know, watching them closely, fixing them and not uh, having to deal with it. Um, 
So even though this patient remodeled well, I don't think that this is what, uh, you know, this would be the ideal way of treating uh, this uh, this fracture. So let me have uh, Dr. Slongo. Uh, are you on? Can you unmute yourself? Because I see that, um, you know, you have raised your hand, but I don't uh, uh, hear your voice. Um, so, Premal, this was your case. Uh, would you have uh, fixed it uh, at the time when uh, when the, when you initially saw the patient? I think I would have fixed it because I think uh, this is an uh, area in which you know there's a very high chances of uh, separation, and we have already always thought that if you don't have a good physial alignment, there is a high chance of uh, you getting a physial arrest. So, one lucky case wouldn't mean that every time you will be lucky like this. It may be a good idea, at least in an older child like this, to put a K-wire from top to bottom, like integrated as Dr. Grikin shown. And probably we'll see in the second case, uh, that will be uh, giving a good example as well, how to fix this injury. Yeah, Chital, I think the, the it, you know, the distal femoral physio fracture, um, I think we, we often think of it as a fracture, but we need to remember it's a physio injury. And so the the worst thing that can happen, we have to think about the worst thing that could happen in this fracture. And, and in a young patient, that's a growth disturbance or growth arrest. And so the principles to um, what's best for the physis, um, as uh, Pramal just said, is to get the physis you know, reduced. Um, so if there's displacement of the physis, increased risk of arrest. We want to avoid multiple manipulations across the physis. And so if you reduce it, and then you're watching it weekly and it moves and you reduce it again and you reduce it again, you're just grinding the physis. Uh, and then we want, if we are fixing across the physis, we want minimal fixation and, and something smooth. So I think, uh, um, I think it's important just to remember um, what's kind of best for the growth plate in these cases. I agree. So we'll uh, move on to the next case, which is a salted two fracture of the distal femur. And, um, this fracture was reduced and was uh, fixed with uh, with K wires. You know, you can use two cross K wires. Here, four wires were used, um, and the fracture went on to heal fine. Here, I'm not really sure that there was a loss of reduction or it wasn't reduced anatomically because on this lateral X-ray you can see that the distal fragment may be lip touch posteriorly translated. I'm not really sure because it's not a perfect lateral view. Um, and at three months, uh, the this is the result. Now, you know, this has gone on to physical arrest, but may not be an issue because the patient uh, is old enough. The patient is 15 years old, so might not have to do anything about it. Uh, Prima, did you have to do anything after this, after this uh, physical arrest? Um, Sheetal, I think uh, there's some mix of uh, x-rays, but uh, I, I don't think we can do anything about this at, at this point of time. 15 years is very close to maturity and it may be a good idea to take an X-ray on the opposite side and see what is happening. But uh, this is a very likely uh, uh, end of this physical uh, uh, injury if it is at uh, age of 15 years. Because we have tend to see that type 1 injury is best, is most common when either physis is very young, like in a, in a, a very young child or when it is fusing. So at 15 years, if it is fusing, I won't be much worried about it. Great. And uh, one other case of distal femur. So this is again a salter two in a 15 year old, fixed um, with cross K wires. And I think <laughs> everyone would be happy with the fixation here. Uh, this is six weeks post op X ray, maybe just a touch loss of reduction. However, at six months post injury, the patient had significant stiffness, as you can see here. Um, and so the audience poll is, what would you do? It's six months out, distal femur fracture that was treated with fixation and now it's stiff. Would you just wait? Would you do knee manipulation? Would you do cortices plasty? Or you would do an um, additional lysis? Okay, so it's kind of a split between wait and watch manipulation and additional, additional lysis. So 
let's uh, see what the panels have to think about this versus whether you would have treated it any differently. So if you go back and look at the x-rays, would you have treated this injury any differently than what was done here? So Sheetal, if I may add this, child had an open reduction through um, a central incision. Somehow the surgeon couldn't get it right, so he had to open it and reduce it. Okay. So um, any um, anything that uh, you want to comment, uh, Min or Ted, or you th you think this is acceptable at this point? I think there's a really yeah, nice. Re go ahead. No, go ahead, Ted. Um, I think there's a really nice reduction. I I tend to go uh, proximal to distal, as opposed to distal to proximal. Um, I'm not saying that you wouldn't have had the same outcome. Any any knee can get stiffness, but uh, I try to um, uh, avoid. Uh, um, causing any other um, reason for the intraarticular portion of the joint uh, to have any other uh, more advanced healing response. Yeah, I think the additional history that Pramal gave us was important because I think when you, you know, treat these with pins um, cast, you know, typically for six weeks and then you start to mobilize them, it's pretty uncommon um, to get a stiff knee. Um, and so I think if you do an open reduction though and immobilized, I think uh, that's sort of a risk factor for getting a stiffer knee. Sheetal, if may I said, how often have you needed an open reduction for type one or two distal femoral physal separation? Because I haven't had a reason to do open reduction till date in this type of injury. Generally it reduces well. Agreed. No, I, I would agree that we don't need open reduction, but stiffness can happen even with close reduction and KY fixation. So, uh, so that is something that we always want to keep, uh, you know, um, keep on back of our mind and mobilize these patients as soon as we can, as we see, because these fractures they heal pretty fast. There's no re no reason to keep them immobilized for like six weeks um, or so, maybe three or four weeks. So. Anyway, so this patient had arthroscopic, um, you know, additional lysis, and this is one and a half years post arthroscopy, and he had regained his uh, motion. I'll bring Tushar uh, now um, um, for his case, which is an eight-year-old with a knee injury, and this fracture was irreducible under general anesthesia. So the audience question is that, what would you do? Eight-year-old distal femur fracture cannot reduce it closed under general anesthesia. And the options um, are for um, intrafocal reduction techniques, open reduction in a supine or a prone position, or if there are other options. Okay, so more than half of uh, uh, Seventy-five percent said they would do open reduction. The approach is most common is supine, and then it could be in a prone position as well. Um, you know, Tushar, Tushar, before we, you know, before you share what you did for this case, did this patient have a neurovascular injury, or, or were you concerned about that? No, the patient didn't have any neurovascular injury. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I think the apparent tibia is probably more prone to developing neurovascular vis-a-vis -vis the distal femur. Mm -hmm. So you went on and you did uh, an open reduction through a lateral approach. And yeah, you put, so uh, what really happened here is that uh, we put the patient prone and we try to attempt the reduction like how it's described, like how you would probably do compare it to a supracondylar. You know, that's how our traditional teaching was, and we were successful before, but it would not budge. And I have had very bad experiences with forceful reduction across the physis before. So I decided it's better to open. In fact, I took a lateral approach and I removed some soft tissue interposition and I was unable to reduce it still. So I was surprised and I had to take a collateral approach then and there was a part of some medial tissue like, I can't recollect exactly, but part of the VMO or something which had got interposed and that when we removed and then bang, it came in. Then it was very stable. But in spite of it being stable, we passed one single transfacial pin, a thin pin and we immobilized in a cast for uh, the wire was removed in 10 days and we mobilized the patient in about three weeks time. He went on to do well uh, eventually. <coughs> For this patient, unfortunately, I don't have a follow-up longer than that. 
No, that's a great, a great case, you know, um, irreducible fracture, then what do you do and how you approach it? Um, I had, I just remember top of my head, uh, one patient that uh, we ended up opening through the uh, popliteal uh, fossa. You have to be careful because the vessels were right there tenting onto the metaphyseal spike. So uh, it needs to be a little bit, uh, you know, um, a cautious approach. Uh, but it's better to open it where the metaphyseal fragment is because that is more likely to be interposed. And, you know, trying to approach this from a supine position might be difficult. You can still get around it, you know, if you can uh, pull the fragment up, the metaphyseal fragment. But um, it's a, uh, it, is a, it is a good case. Any comments, uh, Min, Tad, or Dr. Wilkins? I just think that's a good example, uh, again, of of what I said previously about being uh, respectful of the physis. So, you know, to do a forceful reduction um, across the physis, uh, you worry about injury of the physis. Um, I think the fixation here across the physis was, you know, minimal, um, again, which is respectful of the physis. Completely agree with that. If And if I try to get those, I completely agree with your initial reduction mover, maneuver as well. It's the one time when I, you know, I have them under, obviously under general anesthesia, but I'll, it's the one time I'll ask anesthesia for paralysis to use that and lots of traction um, and try to treat it, you know, like a supercranial, but if it won't reduce, then, and again, those are the ones that can have that periosteum interposed. So I 100% agree with that plan and Min's comments. Um, yeah, Dr. Slongo, you know, any comments about distal femur fractures in general? Like, um, yes. Any, any, yes. I have some comments about all the about all the uh, cases you have seen before. In my opinion, we are too less critical, and we give not the correct message and uh, sign to to the to all because we we are focused only on the fracture, but we do not analyze a little bit what is behind the fracture or uh, the forces of the fracture. Especially now, exactly this case, we are discussing the, the cursor wire, the implant, uh, regarding of the damage of the physis, but mostly you forgot the surgeon. And in all this, and this is my talk tomorrow, uh, in all these cases, you know, the most damage is done by the surgeon himself. That means if a surgeon sees such a fracture as this one here, only once a year, and he tried to reduce it, and he do it so violent, and tried one hour, he damaged the physis 10 times more than a, a smooth pin through the physis. We know this. And th therefore, we should focus a little bit on this, that especially for all the, our colleagues outside in the field who are dealing with such fracture once a month, every half year or so, give them good advices or good tips how to do this. And not only because we, we discussed how we do this in our hand and in our hand, it will work. Okay. And uh, we have to focus a little bit on our audience uh, that we give good tips. A, a typical example was the first fracture is a six year old child. You know, you, are, you have discussed about a dislocation. No, this fracture was absolutely anatomical online, perhaps half a centimeter transverse in the sagittal plane, but absolutely no angulation, nothing. And in a young child like this, the fracture is stable. And I was astonished that the majority would pin it. In contrary, the 12 year old child with the same fracture, which has a much higher risk because of the liver arm and the, the trauma itself, to uh, re-dislocate or dislocate even in a splint or in a, in a, in a, spy, in a in cast, the majority did not fix it. So you see, we have to discuss a little bit more carefully how we deal this fracture and why we deal this fracture in this way and what we should avoid and what is the risk. So therefore, I guess I'm not so happy with some of, of the statements. Okay, so but you know, th but that is a reason to bring up these cases is to make sure we get the message across is that you know younger patient not involving the physis like the metaphysical six year old could be done in a close fashion, and distal femur fractures which are physical injuries 
even though they may appear to be anatomic, it's better to just fix them because not only the risk of displacement, but the risk mm -hmm. of uh, you know physical arrest is more if you don't fix these fractures compared to fixing them and stabilizing them. So exactly. That is the correct message. So we will move exactly. on to the next set, which is Atida spine fractures. Um, so here is a case, six year old um, male. I'm gonna go a little bit quick with these cases. We already had a little bit of discussion with this and uh, this we have, we tried to cast it um, in and reduce it uh, in extension and then flex it and uh, put a cast on, but it did not stay reduced. And uh, you know, in the last few years I have not been uh, very keen on reducing these fractures. I tend to fix the displaced uh, fractures. Uh, this is, you know, two K wires. One is uh, to hold the fracture reduction. The other one is to put the screw in. I tend to use transficer screws because I get better fixation and purchase so I can mobilize them early. The downside is that we do have to go back in and remove it, uh, you know, once the fracture is healed. But there are different ways we, dis we discuss the screw fixation versus the, uh, the uh, suture fixation for these fractures. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit of uh, a controversial case. I'd like to get uh, the faculty uh, to comment. So 11 year old boy, you can see that the flake of tibial spine here is very small, a very small sliver of bone of tibial spine fracture. And if you look at the AC, uh, the, uh, the sagittal MRI, you can see that the ACL is intact, but, uh, but the piece is small, the, uh, the tibial spine piece. What what do you think you would do? You would try to fix this with sutures, or would you try to do an ACL reconstruction for these fractures with very small piece? Yeah, I think this can be a home run with fixing it <clears throat> with sutures. And um, you know the uh, like the actually the video I showed probably was a similar you know chondroepiphyseal small piece of bone. Uh, and so I think when you see that, when you see a big tibial spine, like your first case, um, I think it's a pretty obvious tibial spine. When you see a small fleck of bone, I think MRI there is very helpful because it's, it's really more of an ACL avulsion type of injury. And so in this situation, you know, you can pass sutures and repair the ACL to the bed and it heals very well <clears throat> and you're not doing an ACL reconstruction. So the recovery is faster, the results are better. Um, and so that, that I think is a, a good place, um, a Chital to, to repair. Yeah. Ted, any, any, anything else, anything different that you would do? I agree. And I think that follows our, uh, our principles of, uh, avulsion fractures with small, uh, uh, portions of bone on the backside, they can be fixed. I do think this is where, uh, suturing uh, is is more ideal than uh, screw fixation, just because you don't have much in the way of bone on the back. Yeah, so this is one of my case that uh, that I had to revise, and that's the reason I brought it. You know, there have been studies that have shown that after fixing a tibial spine, there is almost like a ten percent rate that they might need an ACL reconstruction. You know, down the road, whether it's because of instability or recurrent injury, uh, but I haven't had uh, you know. I'm lucky, I would say, that I haven't had to revise my tibial spines or at least have an ACL after that, except for this one case. Because this one here, I fixed with a screw. I thought that there is enough bone. I fix it with a screw here. I use a uh, suture around the washers so that I can remove it easily later on. Uh, so this was the fixation. I was happy with that. I removed it at three months. It appeared to have healed, as you can see here. But then four months later, the patient had a fall again. I don't know if it was really a fall or my fixation was kind of tenuous but the patient did avulse it again. And this time the fragment was even smaller because I think the screw had you know, probably you know, made the piece a little bit you know, comminuted. And so the patient eventually underwent uh, an ACL reconstruction here that you can see now the piece is not like it was on the previous MRI. And so um, uh, the bone age uh, was 12 years and you know, all these options were considered, you know, iliotibial bent, the epiphyseal and transficial, and I went with the epiphyseal ACL reconstruction and the patient, I've got a two year follow-up as well recently and the patient has done fine. But the, but the bottom line is that, you know, a similar patient here, you can see a sliver of bone here, 14 year old with ski injury. And, you know, you can call this a tibial spine fracture. I got a little bit wise because of my previous failure and I didn't end up with suture fixation here, like, um, you know, 
and uh, Tad, you had talked about the shoulder anchors, and that was done here, you know, um, just for that piece that was staying up, you know, we put in um, a couple of suture anchors in the joint after we fix it with um, pull-out uh, sutures, and the fish went on to do okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the message here is that, uh, you know, you need to be well versed with this comminuted and small fragments to use suture fixation. And with the bigger fragments, I, I don't think it matters much whether you fix it with uh, screws versus, um, versus uh, the uh, sutures. I just want to ask uh, your, uh, your um, you know, uh, when Min, when you did your talk, you said that you had found that more patients with, uh, with, uh, with um, screws had instability compared to patients with suture because you could tighten the ACL. Did you mean laxity or did you mean instability in the sense that most patients had to have a revision ACL surgery? Yeah, no, it was really laxity. So it was looser on physical exam. Uh, you know, I've found yeah. that tibial spine fracture leading to a later ACL injury also is pretty uncommon. And you might think it'd be higher just given, you know, the athletic risk factors of a kid who's injuring their knee at a young age. Um, and usually it's like years later and another injury. So the one you showed with failure of four months, I think is a, is an atypical case. Right. So we'll move on to the tibial tuberosity fractures. Uh, uh, this is uh, the one that uh, Min, you had shown a similar case. I don't think any controversy about this, that you would fix it with, um, with, uh, uh, with screws. Here is a post-op at three months. Now here is a fracture, which, is an intra-articular fracture, 15 year old. My question is that when you are trying to approach these fractures, when you fix these fractures with screws, what are you doing at the joint surface? Are you having a direct look by doing an arthrotomy? Are you putting a scope in? Are you, or are you just doing it on a fluoroscopy uh, evaluation? How do you judge your reduction at the joint surface? Yes, yeah, so this is a type three fracture. So this is the one that goes up the apophysis um, through the epiphysis into the joint. Um, and, you know, I typically reduce these um, and then hold them like provisionally with a wire. And then I usually do do, do an arthrotomy to evaluate um, the articular surface. Um, I haven't um, um, liked to do arthroscopy in this situation, although Ted showed an example um, because I worry a little bit about all the arthroscopic fluid under pressure going into the compartment, and it's already a fracture. We worry about compartment syndrome, so I haven't I haven't had the guts to do arthroscopy at the same time. Um, but I think it's it's an intraarticular fracture, and so I think you want it reduced on X-ray. Um, but I think you also uh, really want to make sure um, that it's uh, that the joint uh, surface itself is reduced. And I think someone just commented that it might be a type five fracture. And I think it really might be as well because you see the type three component and it looks like there's that posterior metaphyseal component as well. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fibula. This fracture I know because I had, had advanced imaging on this. So this is a type three. It is not, doesn't have a metaphyseal component, but, but yes, you have to be concerned about it looking at the x-ray. So Tad, on these injuries, any other uh, uh, means that he's going to do an arthrotomy? Would, how would you treat the joint side of it. Yeah, I've actually moved um, to um, away from uh, arthroscopy for the most part. Um, the image that uh, I had started in my practice doing arthroscopy on all of these to, to evaluate those. And, and I, I was um, from a practical standpoint, moved away from that. I'll do a small arthrotomy to check and feel that. And then I find from an efficiency standpoint, I think Min's points about um, uh, about extravasation of fluid uh, is appropriate as well. Um, and um, I used to go um, by cortical on screws, and now I'm going um, unicortical with screws. Okay, so this is how the fracture was fixed. It looks okay, you know, to me on this x-ray, this was another surgeon's case, excellent surgeon. Um, just as we know, the most common complication or issue is prominence of the screw or irritation from the screw. So the hardware was removed when the patient had nine and nine months still continued to have pain after this fracture. And if you look very closely, there is a small gap at the joint surface on the lateral view. 
So this is when the patient had, uh, you know, come to uh, come to uh, us uh, for evaluation because uh, he was continuing to have pain. Now, if you look at the MRI, there is definite edema on the lateral side of the of the um, uh, of the tibia, and if you look at the sagittal, there is meniscus interposition. You can see it very well on the sagittal view. The meniscus is interposed in the fracture side. The the um, the, uh, the gap that you saw on that. So if you look at the arthroscopy here, you can see that the, the black line is pointing to the fracture site. You can see part of the torn meniscus in the fracture site. Remaining lateral meniscus, this is a posterior horn here. This is the anterior horn, but part of the anterior horn was torn and was flipped here into the fracture site. We don't see this too often, but you know, if we don't open up the joint or if we don't make sure that the fracture has no gap, there is definite possibility of interposition. I don't think this would be, um, the in meniscus interposition is a teaching point. The teaching point is to get a good articular surface reduction. You know, when we are treating intraarticular injuries, whether we do a scope, whether we confirm it uh, with an arthrotomy, but um, just wanted to bring this point that, you know, have seen some other issues besides, you know, um, uh, the uh, the gap and then once we did once we took out the meniscus you know it it his pain did decrease so uh, it was it was loading directly onto a torn meniscus. I'll move on to a next case here and this patient presented he was fixed somewhere as the three point five screws fifteen year old male and why do we think that this may have failed you know is the question uh, similar injury to the case you know seen above and um, you know. The, I would just give you the story is that this patient had had this fixed, was in an immobilizer, and at four weeks, he was allowed to go back to basketball. He was a competitive basketball player. And so he was, you know, and there are several factors when we decide to return to sports, but four weeks, I think, is too early. But just want your comments on how would you, uh, you know, would you have treated this differently? Min. This looks like a type three injury as well. And, uh, you know, I think the uh, probably inadequate fixation. So I think three, five, you know, screws are, are too small here. I think uh, uh, maybe three, five, if you get the poster cortex might be strong enough, but typically you're using 6.5 or 4.5 um, screws. Um, and then they're usually, you know, um, six weeks till their weight bearing is tolerated. Uh, full motion, and then they're doing rehab protocol. Return to sport seems to be more like at four to six months, not at, at four weeks. So this was probably a combination of too soon return and, and maybe inadequate fixation. Perhaps a little convergence of the screws. It's only one view, so you're not seeing both. But Yeah, so this was revised with four or five screws. You know, we have, you know, tested them for like three or four weeks if compliance is an issue if the patient is like, you know, uh, Go, trying to get back to soon, um, <clears throat> but uh, these are adolescent patients. They understand, but I would agree with return to sports at 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 least four months before we can allow them to go back and do sports. Um, he did fine, you know, uh, after we revised it. Um, but just to uh, point uh, to the uh, fixation, as I I mean, three point five probably may be okay if you have gone by cortical. These these are typically big patients. You know, they are, uh, you know have very strong quadriceps, uh, you know, most of them have higher BMIs, so getting a little bit uh, stronger fixation. Yes, Dr. Slongo. Uh, it's the same as I mentioned before. Can you go back one slide? Can you go back? Okay, look, we, we have discussed the size of the screws, but this is not the main problem here. And we see this even with 6.5 screws or 4.5 screws. No, there is a technical failure, you know, all screws. Of course, we see only one plane. But anyway, uh, there are not a lot of space uh, in the AP view for a different insertion of the screw. But you see, what is the failure? These all three screws are working like a single screw. They go all to one point. So we have to mention this to our delegates, make it correct. Not say, okay, make it like this, but with a bigger screw, no. Place the screw exactly in the good way and not to one point. It's better to go divergent than convergent. So therefore, this I mentioned a little bit in our discussion. We should focus and give good tips. 
I'm not going no, to this, say. Okay. I, I I took out the the AP X-ray, but there was divergence on the AP view. I I have the AP X-ray. There was yeah. diver. So it's not like it's a single screw here. Yeah. I'm sorry that I didn't put up the AP X-ray, but you know. But anyway, your point it's, is, in, it's in one plane. Anyway, when you look in the lateral view, there are all screw nearly on the same plane. You agree? Yes, that, that I agree that they are too close as well. They could Absolutely. be better spread, um, you know, on the on the lateral view. So yeah. just to bring up the point that you know, prop, you know, fixation techniques, you know, probably you know, AO principles, uh, which are basic standard principles for fixation, should be should be followed with this. So we'll move on to the proximal tibial fractures. Uh, Jaydeep, this is uh, your case. We'll just focus on the right side. So it's a uh, uh, Salter uh, one, you can say. But the thing is that it looks like a Salter one, but actually there is a fracture which is in particular here. So you could see here, no, no classification for these fractures on the Salter Harris classification, but there is an intraarticular fracture here. Jaydeep, you want to take it from here? Yes, sir. So we also suspect the cell, the epiphyseal combination we can see here. So we have decided to. Uh, here we have not done the any CT or MR, MRI scan. We did the orthogram. Next slide. We did the orthogram. Here you can see on trace X-ray the epiphyseal fracture is displaced here. You can see here the gap clearly. So we just reduce the close and just fix with the 4 mm CC screw. You can see after fixation of the fracture, nice articular alignment here. This is a final picture. This post-op X-ray. Okay, so uh, I will just ask the faculty: Would you have done anything differently? This case turned out to be fine. Any comments? It was uh, an intraarticular uh, fracture with uh, physal separation as well. Yeah, I think that's an unusual fracture pattern, but um, you can see it. Um, I do I do worry when you get the intraarticular component about um, the lateral meniscus. We know with lateral tibial plateau fractures, um, there can often be lateral meniscal um, entrapment or lateral meniscus injury uh, as well. So maybe an arthrotomy here might, might be useful um, also. This might be one where MR could be helpful as well. Yeah, I mean, I would agree, you know, for intraarticular fractures, I think, ad, uh, you know, advanced imaging, I think, can give us more information for sure and help in pre-op planning. I think for for Salter 1 and 2, it's okay not to get advanced imaging, but for 3 and 4, I would I would agree, or with an intraarticular fracture like this. So, Jadeep, then you went and removed the implants. Yeah. Yes, sir. So we, we removed the implant at 11 months, and we just see we got the full range of movement with no laxity. And instability. Okay, nice case. So, uh, Hitesh, this is your patient, 13 year old with uh, upper tibial fracture. So, this is the uh, this is the X-ray. Sorry, we don't have knee X-rays. I've just uh, zoomed onto this one here. Now, this is a fracture. Uh, did this patient have any uh, neurovascular injury? Because this is a fracture to be worried about. Yeah, the child did not have any neurovascular injury. Either tibial list posterior was palpable, but as our protocol, we do about Doppler because they might be having the intimal damage also. So we'll the child did not have even compartment syndrome. When you talk about Doppler, you're talking about a handheld Doppler just for distal pulsation. You're talking about a duplex or color Doppler for the flow at the popliteal artery. Uh, color Doppler with them. Okay. So it's a... Uh, we need to treat as the proximal tibia physis fracture and the metaphyseal fracture in adolescent like a adult knee dislocation because vascular injury is very, very common. So can you do an ABI and do you think the ankle brachial index and that would give you a little bit of an idea before doing, uh, yes. you know, uh, but yeah, your that, protocol is... Yeah, for the proximal tibial adolescent fracture, we need to suspect because high index of the suspicion should be there for the proximal tibial metaphyseal fracture in adolescent, not in a young child less than 10 years, and physial fracture, physial separation, type 1, 2, or any other proximal tibial physial fracture. Yeah, but the, here the question is there. Yeah, that's the, the, the vessel goes like that, and it's a very high complication. So 
Yeah. We need to ask the fact. Yes, you have already. Shown. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would like to ask. You know, your protocol about these injuries. You know, would you just assess the perfusion initially, or would you do anything to assess the vascular flow? Uh, are you concerned about you know having issues later on by an intimal tear or something? Or if the yes. patient is well perfused distally, then you would just proceed with uh, with close reduction and pinning like done in this case. If the uh, patient has a well perfused leg with a good oxygen saturation with the pink that still there will be chances of the intimal tear, but we'll go ahead and proceed with the fixation. But what we generally do, we keep them admitted for the couple of days. So then we have to, we don't discharge on the same day or next day. So at least two days, particularly of proximal tibia patient. Okay. Any comments, uh, Ted or Min, or you think this is adequate? Yeah, I just had a question about um, timing of surgery. And so um, I think we have acute neurovascular injuries, and then we have a fracture that's in a displaced position that's affecting in either inflow or outflow um, vascular. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in, in our institution, we have a trauma room that starts at 7.30 in the morning. Um, so we could get this case in then. Uh, but what if this case came in in the evening, you know, 7 or 8 p.m.? Um, would you do this in the middle of the night or would you do this uh, first thing the next morning? I would personally do it in the middle of the night. I don't feel comfortable leaving it in this position. Uh, Ted, do you have any um, any thoughts? Yeah, I fully agree with that. And, and I like I really like Dr. Shaw's uh, point about uh, following these, keeping these kids admitted, uh, following them along, staying in close communication, um, you know, that following week as well. Um, some of these intimal tears will, will present late, they'll start to get some symptoms. Uh, and so um, I, I fully agree that the reduction is beautiful. Um, I agree with that philosophy um, and just uh, being mindful of that topic. Okay, we'll uh, discuss a couple of other cases. And, you know, just for the faculty, we have, uh, you know, run out of time. We'll still continue. But if you have to leave, uh, you know, if you have other commitments, we totally understand. Uh, we'll just take another maybe 10 or 15 minutes to run through a couple of other cases. But um, it has been a great session. I've learned a lot to myself. So I would really like to thank, um, uh, you know, Tad and Min. Uh, uh, if you're going to stick around, we'll go ahead with the uh, with uh, other cases. So this is um, a 16 year old boy um, uh, who had was having pain for um, three weeks um, and had his injury the year before that. So it, there was an old injury, and then you can see some flake of bone there um, on the X-ray. You can also see there is a void there, or maybe a defect of the uh, condyle. Now, when you do an MRI, that's a big piece, a 2.4 millimeter piece, probably it's out for a year now. Um, and you can see that uh, there's a defect in the lateral femoral condyle. The patient was advised cartilage restoration procedure by a sports surgeon that we would excise this and we would do an ACI uh, uh, for this. And the patient had come for a second opinion. Uh, the um, this is how it looks, uh, you know, the piece on other views and the, and the donor side there. So um, my question is, would you think that it is too late? It's already been a year uh, since this has fragment has been dislodged. Uh, there are some secondary changes on the femoral condyle or would you, you know, attempt to fix the, uh, the fragment? It's a big piece. Yeah, just fix it. I think it's a, a message we really have to get out because I think as we see more you know, adult cartilage centers, uh, I think they're very quick to move to um, ACI, Macy, Allograft, other things um, for these injuries. Whereas I think it, when they're happening in, in children and adolescents, we forget um, the greater healing ability that they have. And also the fact that if they, if the cartilage, if you go in and the piece, the cartilage looks good on the piece and you fix it and heal, they keep their own cartilage. And that's always better than any type of <clears throat> cartilage. Um, so I would, I, would get, I would have a good conversation with the family uh, because sometimes it doesn't heal and you end up having to do that anyway. But I would, I would give them a chance. If it was my kid, I would like them to have had a chance. Uh, I completely agree. I have three, four such cases as well. And what we see, and this is different from adults, I see, and we see this on the MRI, 
uh, the, the cartilage is still living. That means he has nutrition from the liquid from the joint. That is, it's a good cartilage. And uh, mostly it's grow uh, bigger than before, but the, the bed where the cartilage is uh, uh, broken out is smaller. So I agree, we go for refixation. Mostly we do not trim the, the cartilage. We make the bed a little bit bigger that it fits very well in the bed and fix it. And then over the time you will have a very good uh, situation. We have, we have very special anchors for this. This is a fantastic uh, implant. They are anchors uh, with a screw. Uh, I go from the cartilage or it's not an anchor, it's a hook, it's a hook. With a, a, like a cursor wire with a hook and a threaded tip. So I go through the, through the, through the fragment out of the bone, then the hook pulls, pulls the fragment, and from outside I tighten, I tighten the hook and hold the fragment inside. I have never go back to the knee, and I can remove the screw from outside. This is a special a, a hook. So there we have no screws, as you can see here. We have hooks under the cartilage, and the screw part is outside of the knee on the bony side for pulling. Yeah, so this patient had the piece healed. We put it back, we used metal screws. I think biomechanically, I think, um, you know, uh, screws are, uh, I think, mechanically stronger compared to other bioabsorbable implants or suture fixation. But those are the options. You, I think, you know, there are patients who have been treated with, uh, you know, bioabsorbable pins. Uh, or with sutures as well. And I think those are reasonable options, but uh, this patient went on to heal fine. I have uh, a long-term follow-up on this patient uh, and they are really happy about it. Um, uh, and uh, one of the thing I would just bring it to attention is that the notch view, you know, is, is something that you always want to get on patients who have suspecting for osteochondral injuries. You can see the AP view doesn't show it, but when you do a notch view here, you can see this was, uh, you know, a patient who was referred and uh, my partner's patient. But just to bring, uh, just to make sure that everyone understands that the notch is really important if you want to look at the posterior side, especially for OCDs. I think we need to uh, make sure we just don't get AP and lateral views. You might miss it. The one more case here. This is an 11-year-old old girl who um, had a patellar dislocation with pain, swelling, and limp. And there is a piece, um, an osteochondral piece here. Uh, and... Um, you can see that you know this is 1.9 centimeters measured on the MRI coming out from the medial in, inframedial aspect of the patella. This is the axial view on the top. The sagittal view is on the uh, bottom here. Um, typical location for an osteochondral fracture after patella dislocation is the inframedial part of the patella. And um, and my question is, what would you do? One is to whether you would fix this fragment. Second is, would you do anything to the patella when you are going in to fix it? And what are your uh, what what are you thinking when you have an osteochondral injury following a dislocation? Okay, so for me, um, if patients have a a dislocation, they don't they do not knock off um, chips of cartilage or bone. I can they can be offered the my pediatric sports ABCs activity modification brace and continued rehab. If they're not knocking off fragments of bone and or cartilage, then I prefer to address that and then also do something to address the knee instability, be it patellofemoral ligaments reconstruction with or without tuberculoplasty, um, things along it, of that nature. Uh, in terms of fixation of that, um, there was a participant, and I apologize for not getting his name, but he said, what about transosseous suture bridge fixation? And now I'm a big fan of that actually. So I'll use uh, I, I will secure uh, fragments and I like to use sutures. I'll use um, um, uh, vicral sutures. I'll drill through and use a Keith needle um, to pull sutures through and tie over and that way I don't have to come back. Um, if there's a reason to come back then I, and I have to do something else, then I don't mind uh, compression screws, but I prefer not, not to return. Min, um, anything different? Yeah, I think if, you know, this is a good example to me, Chital, if you go back to the x-rays, um, this is a good example to me on uh, patellar dislocations. You know, if you have a patellar dislocation with a large heme arthrosis, um, you may not see much on x-ray, and I think getting an MRI is helpful. 
Um, if you have a patellar dislocation in a loose jointed patient who doesn't have a large hemarthrosis, their chance of a loose body is much less. But you know, here I, I don't see actually that much. Um, and, and I think it'd be easy to miss such a big loose body because it's almost all cartilage uh, on the x-rays, whereas it's so apparent on the MRI scan. Um, and then I, if it's a big piece like this, I usually do it through a medial um, patellar uh, arthrotomy. And through that, you can fix it, but then you can also make a decision about repairing the MPFL versus doing a simultaneous MPFL reconstruction. Uh, for a first-time dislocation, my uh, tendency has been to repair the MPFL, not do an MPFL reconstruction um, initially. Great. So, you know, um, I usually have done this uh, two-stage. I would fix the fracture first. Uh, this is the fixation through a medial uh, parapetular arthrotomy, uh, fix it with uh, screws. And um, usually I go back at three months to take out the screws. I can evaluate the cartilage. Uh, I've, never, I've not seen a patient who would not heal it. There may be a little bit of delamination or a little bit of, uh, you know, um, fibrillation at the cartilage. And then I do a MPFL reconstruction when I go back to remove the hardware. And um, this is just uh, those views. So we have plenty of cases. I've got 100 other slides, but I think we have run out, run out of time. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate, uh, you know, um, uh, Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Slongo to join for this conversation and for the tips, and especially Dr. Uh, Poker and Dr. Ganley for excellent talks and sticking around, even though it's like 25 minutes past the, uh, the scheduled time. So I really appreciate um, uh, um, your contribution for this session. And um, I would hand off uh, to Tarul for closing remarks. Sheetal, before you go, there are a few unanswered questions specifically to you. If you can yeah. just type and answer them. Okay. Or if you have some common uh, questions, which are more, then we can just take them. Yeah, th there was some concern regarding the chondral fragment fixation using absorbable vicryl fixation. And when do you go to remove screws and how difficult is it? I think Min can comment because they have a paper out there for condyl only fragment fixation. Um, and uh, uh, I have agreed with all the comments about trying to fix those, even though you don't see too much bone on a CT or an X-ray, these frag fragments may have a single layer of, you know, uh, osteoblast and it would heal fine. But uh, Min, do uh, you want to take that question about screw versus suture? Yeah, I think you could do either. I, I think you often, um... Uh, you know, the stakes are high and you want to get stable internal fixation, which I think you can get better with screw fixation usually. I think it's stronger. And then taking out the screws, um, it tends to be fairly easy to do. And it also gives you the advantage of seeing how things have healed or to stage an MPFL reconstruction, as you mentioned. Yeah, but I have that discussion up front, Sandeep, when I'm fixing this, that it is two stage for me. So it's not okay. like, you know, it's not a planned surgery. You know, you tell them we're going to fix this, we we'll remove it at three months and we'll stabilize it. You tell them up front and they're okay with it. I've not had a patient or a family deny that form of treatment. I'm really happy with that approach because I could evaluate the cartilage, make sure that it's healed. Sometimes I may have to nibble off some, you know, overhanging parts or something and just make it smooth, but then I don't have to go back in. But yes, it is, right. it is to surgery. Uh, I just have one more question for Min. When you do the MPFL repair primarily when you're fixing the chondron fragment, do you uh, plicate it? Do you tighten it a little bit? No, I usually will on the MRI see where the uh, injury was. And so if it's off the patella or if it's off the femur, and then I usually repair it with anchors. Now you are going through the medial retinaculum when you do a medial parapatellar arthrotomy to fix the fragment. So when you're repairing the retinaculum, I do that with horizontal mattress sutures. Uh, and so I probably am doing a bit of a plication at the same time. Okay, so it's a good idea to bring it over uh, the anterior part of the patella to tighten it up a little bit. I think so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think uh, I would I, I would like to summarize uh, today's session. Uh, as pointed out, these are really interesting injuries. Most of them are cartilaginous avulsion injuries. And uh, 
especially the tibial proximal tibial apophyseal fractures could be missed could be intraarticular could cause vascular problems could cause compartment syndromes and it needs attention as well as uh, a proper uh, training as dr shlongo pointed out the surgeon should not be responsible for the complication the fracture has done uh, its job our job is to facilitate uh, the proper treatment rather than uh, an in inexperienced person adding to the damage that point is very well taken but uh, these are special injuries which require a lot of additional training with arthroscopy and as well as special suture techniques as well as implants and i think most pedipods are not very well oriented to arthroscopic training and i i guess most of us need to do some kind of training in arthroscopy and uh, cartilage repair and cart meniscal repairs in case we are going to do intraarticular work as far as the epimetaphyseal work uh, we should remember that remodeling is great around the lower femur in the younger child but periosteal entrapment is a real possibility and towards maturity it's important that we have stable fixation rather than uh, uh kys so that we can mobilize them early and prevent arthrofibrosis so with that i think uh, thank you again very much ted and uh, min for giving your time and uh, contributing to this webinar and uh, dr shlongo and dr wilkins for uh, making this very lively all my indian colleagues thank you very much for your cases and contribution and be sure to be back tomorrow at 6:30 we have a special session on spine fractures in children followed by the much awaited oration by professor uh, terry shlongo on his 37 years of experience uh, of problems with elastic nails so with that i guess it's good night from ifix and we'll see you again tomorrow 6:15 thank you very much thank, thank you so much thank you thanks 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 good night